the alternative arrangements for examinations in summer 2021 uh, to transfer. And obviously, yesterday we had the publication of admissions criteria for post primary schools across Northern Ireland. The Education Committee obviously um, worked on this issue for quite some time. We've been calling for contingency arrangements since last May. We, we wrote to all selective schools last May. We conducted a survey, engagement survey during the summer, and obviously the Assembly unanimously passed an Education Committee motion in November of last year, calling on the Education Minister to bring forward contingency arrangements. Um, regrettably, the Education Minister did not bring forward uh, alternative contingency arrangements. That's observable fact. Um, and we have a situation of, um, of varied uh, criteria in place across schools in Northern Ireland. Anybody want to comment on that particular issue before we move on from it? And obviously we'll consider it with the Minister next week. Content? Okay, we'll, we can return to that with the Minister. Um, another issue that is live is the Minister's removal of Welsh Board qualifications for learners in Northern Ireland from 2022. Um, obviously, for the record, the Education Committee has written to the Education Minister to ask why uh, he has taken that decision to remove Welsh Board qualifications for learners in Northern Ireland um, without consultation with schools or pupils. And I, I noted this morning uh, that the uh, Governing Bodies Association has written to the Education Minister to ask him to reverse that decision. Um, so an uh, 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 extremely concerning issue that we will uh, return to with the Minister next week, if indeed he hasn't decided to change his decision on that before next Wednesday. Justin, you want to come in on that? Yes? Yeah, sure. You know I was the first to raise that last week at last week's committee, and uh, there's no end of discontent among school leaders on that issue, and it's quickly resolved. Yep, that, I, I, there is a groundswell of opinion, as you say, Justin, and um, we may we may see a change in that before next Wednesday. Uh, but if not, we will certainly echo the correspondence that we've already sent to the minister on that issue. Um, also, the issue of vaccinations, members. Yeah, sorry, Chair, before you move on on that, sorry, I, Pat? It's, it's new committee. I had my hand raised there. I'm not sure whether sorry. you used it. We, we do. Sorry, I hadn't spotted it. Apologies. Keep, keep, keep using that tactic, but thanks for bringing it to my attention as well. Pat, go ahead there. Okay, just on the issue of the, the Welsh Examination Board. Um, I mean, I have been heavily lobbied on this issue as well. Uh, it seems, I mean, the common view out there is that the minister uh, had a hissy fit over uh, the Welsh not consulting him, consulting him in regard to uh, uh, cancelling examinations this year. But the upshot of it is, is that there's less choice now for students. Uh, we're limiting choice. There was no consultation with teachers or students. Uh, uh, so... I mean, it's a very unsatisfactory situation, particularly in the middle of this pandemic, when uh, teachers or students are already facing so many challenges that another challenge should be thrown down at them. So uh, uh, I'm glad to hear the Minister's coming in next week, and hopefully uh, we can have a, a serious discussion about it. Thanks. Yes, th thanks for that, Pat. I uh, would agree with your, your sentiments. Um, I think the minister actually is directly quoted as, as stating that um, part, if not all, of the reason was because the Welsh board had not consulted with uh, him in relation to their arrangements for exams this year. So something, if, if, if not resolved prior to next Wednesday, that we will certainly wish to, to raise with the minister. Another issue, members, then, is the issue of uh, prioritisation of vaccinations. You, you may have noted during the week a, a statement in relation to the prioritisation of special school staff, um, which would be welcomed by the Education Committee, um, given our previous correspondence in relation to that. Um, but I imagine we'll wish to ask the Minister about um, ongoing work by the Executive to prioritise other key sectors, such as our early years childcare and education staff. Anybody want to comment on that matter or are or, or content to raise that next week? Can I come in there, Robbie, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's it was good news this week. Uh, I, we do need to give credit to um, the both the Minister for Health and the Minister for Education on this because 
they did work collegiately on it. That's not an easy one to, to sort out uh, because we have been, I think, almost unanimous uh, throughout this pandemic when we say we follow the uh, medical and scientific advice. Uh, and in that context, JCVI is uh, uh, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer are part of that. So I think in what this has shown is the uh, ability and, and the, the real time reaction that is there. But the thing that must be maintained is that we must follow uh, medical and scientific advice. Uh, and we look forward to the time when the vaccination program is fully worked through, uh, all key workers, including teachers. Um, and we also can't also, also disrespect the other things that still need to happen, um, which is the time distance shielding, as we've spoken about before, the need to reinforce that message, because we can see with the new variants coming through and so on, none of this is guaranteed, none of it's concrete. But what does need to be, be reinforced, regardless of the committee you're on, is the need to wash your hands, keep your distance, and, and not travel if it's not appropriate. So I think in that, the other thing that we need to chair is to revisit almost on a weekly basis the remote and blended learning. Uh, programs because they could be with us for a, a period of time as well. So it's looking at everything in the round here. No, that, that, that's helpful, Robbie. I would agree with everything you've said there. <coughs> Excuse me. And obviously, we've we've written to the Education Authority to seek a, an urgent update with regards to a, a proposal to procure additional funded access to uh, a, a digital learning platform, Seesaw. Obviously, there are other digital learning platforms available, but I uh, would agree with you that whilst we want to see those vaccinations rolled out as quickly as possible, um, as that process proceeds, all those other uh, hygiene and safety measures and remote learning procedures remain extremely important. So th thanks for that. Um, okay, I think of a couple of other Chair, matters. Sorry, yes, Chair. Sorry, Mars, go ahead. Trying to come in on the back of, of Robbie there. Uh, go ahead, Mars. We talked extensively about the uh, special education schools. And I have a request from some of the bus drivers to take pupils to and from the special education uh, schools. And it was one, they were wondering if uh, they could be included in a vaccination program that this committee has put pressure on the Minister on the minister of Health to, to conform with. Just maybe we could add that in, could we? Yeah, Morris, I, I think that, that is an issue that's been raised with me as well. You know, to, to whom precisely the prioritisation of special school staff will apply. Um, I think that's a, a good question to put to the, the Minister for next week. Morris, yeah. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks. Apologies to Mr. Chair, hand just... as well there, Morris. Um, keep, keep raising those hands and then be sure to take them down once I've got, once I've got to you. Thanks, Daniel. Chair, uh, just in terms of, there's been a, a quite a bit of uncertainty around which special educational needs staff will be vaccinated. I'm sure you've had these questions because of how it was framed on the media. Uh, but just to be blunt about it, there's 40 special educational needs schools across Northern Ireland. Uh, that, that would roughly, uh, by a crude uh, uh, calculation, work out about 4,500 staff, including bus drivers, I think, um, uh, in terms of vaccination. Slow, slow numbers can be done very quickly. It can be done one day uh, 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 if need be. So uh, it's just to put that out there. Yep, you're working off the same information I've received, Daniel, and you're you're right in terms of the 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 volumes that we're talking about there. So clarity around who that's going to apply to and uh, expeditious implementation of those vaccinations are, are are key indeed. If that hasn't been announced before next Wednesday, something we can seek further clarity on. Um, a couple of other matters I'll raise in the duration of the meeting today, probably in forward work programme around um, further evidence sessions on restraint and seclusion and possible committee motions um, in relation to that and potentially um, RSE as well. Um, I, I, we've done a fair bit of work in relation to RSE and I think a, a committee motion on that might be timely given the uh, extent of the responses that we've received on our inquiries to that. Members, can I also take this opportunity uh, to advise the committee members if they're not aware on the, of the passing of Tom Davis, OBE, former principal at Torbank, and my, if memory serves me right, former chairperson of the Special School Strategic Leadership Group as well, um, that in short would have inspired the, the work of the education committee um, and a number of education committees on special educational needs um, that can't be understated. Uh, the, the leadership Colin showed in relation to 
special education um, was unsurpassed. So I, I would wish on behalf of everyone on the education committee to extend our condolences to his family, friends and colleagues at this time. Okay, members, thank you. Agenda item three then, members, is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 27th of January, 2021 at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, member, agenda item four, matters arising. There, I have no matters arising. Anyone else have matters arising? Nope. Okay, then we can move to agenda item five, our first uh, briefing of today. I'm delighted to say with the mental health champion on people wellbeing, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 14 and a briefing paper at page 16 of table papers? Can I and Peter Cash, Senior Policy Officer uh, with the Mental Health Champion. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will be able to give you 10 minutes to make an opening statement, and this will be followed by questions from members, which can be answered uh, across the panel of witnesses. Before I start, uh, Professor O'Neill and uh, Peter Cash, can I say a very, very sincere thanks um, for accepting our invitation to join us today um, in this Children's Mental Health Week. Um, we've been acutely aware of the many issues uh, challenging the emotional health and well-being of children and young people across Northern Ireland throughout the COVID pandemic and indeed the, the delivery and implementation of the Department of Education's Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework has been a, a genuine priority for the committee. So we, we really value the time with you uh, today uh, and hand over to you, Professor O'Neill. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to be here today and to have this opportunity to talk to you all. Um, so I, I'm just going to start with, with my statement. Um, I'm here today because I'm increasingly concerned about the mental health of our young people and the impact that the pandemic has had on them. Um, as we know, prolonged stress and adversity in childhood leads to mental illness. And of course, it leads to poor educational outcomes too. And I fear that unless we act now and act strategically, that we will have failed a generation of young people. The school work that, that we need from our young people, the learning, the problem solving and complex thought, these are only possible when the body and the brain are calm. It is um, biologically impossible for us to learn when we are in a state of acute stress and anxiety. And that's where too many of our children and young people are right now. The repeated exposure to stress, particularly in childhood when we have neuroplasticity at its peak, when the brain is developing, it actually changes and can change the body's stress response pathways, which can lead children into chronic anxiety, where that stress response is always switched on. And then that can increase the likelihood of behavioral problems caused by like that overactive stress response system and mental illness. So it's impossible to learn when our brains are in this state. And it's my view that we need to address the mental health impact of the pandemic on our children and young people. And that needs to be prioritized so that our kids can return to education and be in a position to learn. So the pandemic has been extraordinarily stressful for our children. In a few days, their worlds completely fell apart. Not only did they have to cope with the stress and uncertainty of a global pandemic that we were all de dealing with and the prospect of death on an unimaginable scale, they also lost contact with their friends and teachers with the closure of schools. And it's hard for us as adults to imagine what this has been like for them. They were faced with a disease that they themselves were unlikely to get ill from. And many of the elements of their life, the things that made life meaningful for them, were taken from them. And they were left completely powerless. We know that social interaction and friendship is vital for good well-being in children and young people. They thrive, they learn, they flourish whenever they're in the company of their peers. The friends have an emotionally regulating influence. They're looking to their friends for cues for their emotional state. They calm each other down. 
And young people experience severe stress when they're isolated from friends. Data from the main studies of the impact of the pandemic in the UK and elsewhere paints a very concerning picture. The Prince's Trust survey of 16 to 25 year olds showed us that almost half, 47%, reported an increase in anxiety and a third said that they were overwhelmed by feelings of anxiety and panic every single day. In Northern Ireland, over half of our young people said they always or often felt stressed and more than a quarter of young people said they were unable to cope with life since the pandemic. The CoSpace study found an increase in behavioural and attentional difficulties and primary school children in the 4 to 10 year age group were more affected than the older children. Both behavioural problems and difficulties with attention are manifestations of stress. And again, I need to reiterate, these are not states conducive to learning or education. On the whole, the lockdowns led to a rise in emotional problems and these subsided whenever the lockdowns eased and the schools reopened. So the opening and closure of schools is fundamental to all of this. <clears throat> In keeping with the adult data, the females, the girls and women had higher levels of emotional difficulties than males. But, and this is something that's not talked about, the boys had higher levels of attentional problems. Again, that will affect their learning and it's a stress response. It's a manifestation of stress. We know that the pandemic has amplified the effect of qualities and this is also the case for mental health. So the Co-Space study found that rates of all types of emotional difficulties were higher for children from low-income households. Children with disabilities and special educational needs were much more likely to have emotional and attentional difficulties. And worryingly, these rates didn't reduce whenever the schools were opened, whenever the lockdowns eased. They stayed really high and that's really, really worrying. Parental stress affects our children's well-being and parental depression also increased when the schools were closed. Lone parents from single adult households and low-income families, as well as parents of children with special educational needs and disabilities, again had a much higher risk and that affects their children too. So the data I'm talking about are data from UK-wide studies um, and we also need to remember that every single mental health study that's ever been conducted has shown that the rates of illness and the rates of difficulties are higher in Northern Ireland. So we had the recent, the recent prevalence study before the pandemic showing us that one in eight of our children had emotional problems and again our rates were higher than other parts of the UK and Ireland. One in six of our children were demonstrating difficulties with eating behaviour and again that's about emotional regulation. It's really, really worrying. So we must assume that the additional mental health impact of the pandemic has a more profound impact on young people in Northern Ireland because they have more existing problems. So there are several characteristics of this period of lockdown that, um, that will cause even more concern. So all of those studies were, were last year at the first period of lockdown. So now we're seeing a prolonged lockdown period occurring during winter where there's fewer opportunities for sport and outdoor play. Again, these are things that are essential for their emotional regulation to help them cope with stress and anxiety. And it's during a time when there's the additional pressures of the high rate rates of death and illness due to, due to COVID. So the pressure in our health services also meant that fewer children have had opportunities for treatment for medical conditions. It's even been difficult to get dental appointments. So I'm concerned also about how the untreated health conditions may have an, a mental health impact on those children as well. <clears throat> Now, we've talked a lot about exams, but again, exams are particularly stressful for, for this age group. And in every study, exam periods are associated with emotional difficulties, even suicidal thoughts, and that's in, in any year. So in Northern Ireland, our children have this additional stress with the uncertainty and confusion around how their assessments are operationalized. And of course, we need to pay particular attention to the well-being of the children in that cohort who are transferring from primary to secondary, secondary schools. So finally, I am concerned that our young people are actually losing hope about their future. And that affects their motivation to work and study on top of everything else. That Princess Trust study found that almost half of our young people think that finding a job now seems impossible. And 
we see the evidence of the lack of autonomy and control that we need for hope. 28% felt powerless to change their future and 65% said that they were missing out on being young. So what do we need to do? Well, the reopening of schools needs to be a priority and, and we've talked we bit about that and that means making plans to make schools COVID secure, vaccinating teachers and school, ensuring that that school environment has adequate space, ventilation, um, using creative options like blended learning and using alternative accommodation where that's possible to ensure that social distancing can be maintained. In relation to young people's mental health, we do need that long term strategic approach and we have the 10 year strategy and the wellbeing framework for and that's all good. But we also need a plan for the short term. So in my view, we need to be monitoring the mental health of pupils and staff because staff are co-regulating our pupils and we need to provide the necessary support in schools when children return. So what I'm really saying here is that the focus of education restart needs to be about connecting children with their friends and promoting emotional regulation and supporting the mental health of pupils and staff. So our teachers will being needs to be supported so they can help us identify children who've been disadvantaged and then get them referrals for interventions where appropriate. There needs to be a strong focus on meeting children's physical needs for safety, food, exercise, so that we have good sleep. And, you know, that's the basis for good mental health. And we need a curriculum there that's actually designed to address children's worries about the pandemic and the virus. So the new school day should consist of that, plus creative activities, healthy meals and opportunities for exercise and play. That psychological safety and connection needs to be promoted before there's any attempt to return to the regular curriculum. Um, we also need a well-being program for the summer. Our children are exhausted and they need a break. And that summer period needs to be viewed as an opportunity to, to get in there and give them a free comprehensive program that focuses on their health and well-being and connecting them with friends. And again, helping those children who need more support get those interventions and even the physical health interventions there too. Finally, and after we've supported children and, and young people to reconnect and regulate, we need to evaluate the impact of the pandemic on the acquisition of knowledge. So we need to assess where they are educationally after we've done that. And we need to do that in a very compassionate uh, way that doesn't stigmatise pupils because that's going to add to the pressure. And that's something I hear that some parents are telling me about. That children are concerned about that as well. Um, so, so we need to assess where they are in terms of their knowledge, their skills and, and their exams and accreditation. And then that will allow us to work with children and parents so that we can intervene to help pupils catch up on whatever learning they might have missed and make those transitions to employment and further higher education. So that, that's really the end of what I've got to say. I'd be delighted to take lots of questions and everything else from you. Thanks very much, uh, Professor O'Neill. Uh, uh, some stark, clear, but extremely helpful advice there. We, we really value your input today and, and, and thank you for that. Um, I, I am, am not one to, um, to, to, to grant um, challenging proposals, but it, it does seem that the, the discussion around the potential for restarting the school year is gaining some traction. And um, mm -hmm. listening to the, the very helpful um, Education Restart Wellbeing Programme that you are effectively uh, proposing there, the question that comes to mind immediately for me is, do, do we have the time? to do that in what is left, left of this academic year and indeed the summer programme? Um, of course, it depends when our schools um, reopen and how they reopen. Um, so I, I, we probably don't, if we're going to do the kind of the emotional regulation stuff and the wellbeing stuff properly, we, we probably don't have time to do all of that assessment and finding out where children and young people are. I, I honestly think that should be postponed for a while so that we can really focus on helping our young people feel valued um, and working out what the impact of this pandemic has been on them. So, you know, some of them are really feeling very, very bad right now and they're in chronic anxiety and the prospect of returning to school 
where they're going to be assessed and they're going to be um, told about what they've missed and what catching up they need to do. That's just heaping more stress and pressure on top of them and it's not going to help and they're not going to be able to learn when they're in that state anyway. Even the assessments that we're talking about here won't be um, they won't be accurate, they won't be reflective of children's potential. I, I just think it really should be about focusing on well-being right now and then. We can look at playing catch-up if that's necessary later. Um, okay. But we just we need, we need to support their mental health before we do anything else. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not... <laughs> hadn't intended to try and ask such a difficult question from the offset here. There's a lot of stuff for us to get through, but I, mm -hmm. my, my time is short. So, I mean, do we need to have a, albeit extremely rapid, but genuine discussion about the potential of restarting the school year in September, given the, the task at hand? Um, I think we need to go ahead and open schools as soon as we can. We need to make a plan for that so that schools can reopen safely. And, and that is about the things I said, vaccinations, thinking about that school environment, ventilation, um, alternative accommodation, blended learning. I think getting the children back in an environment with their peers needs to be needs to be a priority. So at least if they can get that a few days a week, that in and of itself is going to be hugely important. But what happens when we bring children into school is really important as well. And I think this idea that we can get straight back into the school work it's just unrealistic and it's going to add more pressure it's not what i would advise i would advise really thinking about what, what has happened with this pandemic what's children's understanding of what's going on in the world around them and making sure that they can reconnect and they can be creative and they can just talk about what has happened um and play and and have you know the sport and their time with their friends and those sort of quick assessments to find out which children actually need support and yeah. intervention straight away and that'll take yeah. us right up until in my view you know to be honest and that we should just give it that time you know we're not going to lose too much if we just leave it, all of this stuff a few months okay. um, so that we have our children in the right state to learn then next year Okay, and I think the, the detail that you've gone into around uh, an education restart wellbeing program is, is really helpful there. You've, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, can I ask if the Education Minister has sought your advice or if you're, you're scheduled to meet with the Education Minister on, on some of that really helpful um, advice that you've set out there this morning to us? Um, I'm meeting with the Department for Education soon. I've been working with the Department for Education on the Mental Health and Schools framework for a long time, even before I took up this post, and they've been absolutely brilliant. So I'm meeting that group again soon, and I'm meeting the Department of Health soon, and also the Department for Communities, because I think this needs to be a joint effort if we're going to do something. I meet uh, community and voluntary groups every day, and they're telling me they have programs set and their staff willing to do them. You know, they, they want to help with this. The sporting organisations are already planning their their summer programs they do them every year so it's really just about connecting those different groups together and making sure that no child in northern ireland misses out on, on a fun summer experience that's something approaching a holiday um i i think that's so important but so i, I don't know if the minister's coming in person to those okay. to the, the next meeting i plan but i'm certainly working with the department for education and i find them very receptive to to these ideas Okay, and notwithstanding that need for a very focused education restart wellbeing program, how, how fit for purpose is the, the implementation of the Department of Education Emotional Health and Wellbeing Framework at this stage in, in your assessment? I think it's really good, Chris. I'm, I'm really impressed with it. It includes a lot of the core elements that, that we would want to see. Um, of course, it's about implementing it and implementing it fully. But um, I think if if we can keep, bring schools along with us and make sure, I think it's about shifting attitudes and shifting mindsets too. We really need people to be aware of the importance of emotional regulation, of resilience, of mental health and wellbeing, um, and how necessary it is for learning. You know, it's a building blocks for learning, for curiosity. Um, and once we start understanding that, I think it, it will fall into place. So I'm, I'm very impressed with it. You know, I could be critical as well. There's a few things I would change. But on the whole, I think it's really, really strong. And, and I'm very pleased that this has been brought forward. That's encouraging, uh, Professor. And I'm glad you're able to say that. Um, the committee's also met with the Elephant in the Room campaign. Um, they make very specific proposals around a youth-led mental health campaign, a mental health dictionary, a youth mental health website, 24/7 that, that would include 24/7 chat support, 
um, mental health inclusion on the statutory curriculum, training for teachers, smooth referral to CAMS, primary school counselling peer support. Are those recommendations that we should be implementing as a matter of urgency as well? I think um, a lot of those recommendations will, those boxes will be ticked if the mental health and schools framework is implemented in full. So, and also the 10 year mental health strategy, because, um, you know, the, the connection there between the health services and, and schools is really, really important. And that's what that group were highlighting and their recommendations that we really need those sort of fast track referrals from one system to the other. Um, so a lot of those boxes will be ticked. We're not there with, with the website and that's something that might team are working on, you know, and broader, more strategically, something that a mental health champion would be involved with too. So um, th there's a lot of work behind the scenes trying to, to bring this to bring this forward. But I think if you go through what we've got in the framework and the mental health strategy, you'll find that that, that idea of a text service, you know, that, that's in the in the mental health. It's, it's slightly different. It's called something else, you okay. know, but the, the, the prospect of getting immediate support and using technology as well, you know, that's in the mental health uh, strategy and in the, the framework for schools. So there's a lot of good stuff that actually can be mapped onto what elephant in the room and other groups like pure mental and, and, the, you know, the secondary students union as well. They've, they're talking about all of these things. So oh. we, re we really need to listen more to young people. They'll tell us exactly what, what they want, you know, and what the key features are. So, and, and it's great that they're involved with committees like this too. That's great. Um, I'm out of time, but just in closing, uh, I, I, in the time uh, available to me outside of this coach uh, youth football as well. So I completely concur with you in terms of, um, the devastating impact and um, the absence of, of those youth sports have been on young people as well. And, and I really welcome um, your proposal for an education restart wellbeing program to include that, that summer holiday period, mental, medical and dental assessments, physical activity program, age appropriate emotional regulation, mental health assessment. I think that's a really constructive idea that you're, you're putting forward. Professor O'Neill, I'm, I'm very grateful for all the work that you're doing in that regard um, before I move on to my colleagues here for further questions. So thank you very much indeed from me. Thank you. Thank okay, you. members, can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Shane, MLA, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks very much for your presentation, Siobhan. Uh, you've outlined very clearly uh, the difficulties that are facing children in, in this pandemic and the impact that the pandemic is going to have on them. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you've set out, you know, clearly, you know, the difficulties outside of school. And given that one in eight children before the pandemic were already facing emotional difficulties, I think we're probably facing a tsunami of uh, emotional difficulties in the aftermath of this. And I hope that's not uh, too much hyperbole. But um, in many ways, uh, the difficulties in school are going to be two sides of the one coin. On, on, on the one hand, some children will have fallen behind academically, maybe because of difficulties in, in remote learning, poor access to IT devices or Wi-Fi and, and, and so on. Uh, and, and other children will have suffered emotionally or, or, or psychologically. In the first case, children who have fallen behind in school, uh, and the research shows us that children who do fall behind at an early stage often have great difficulty in catching up again unless they get the bespoke support to do so. Uh, uh, and, and you know the long-term effects of children leaving school without qualifications and so on, the more likely they end up uh, in chronic ill health with mental health problems, end up in the criminal justice system, uh, and, and so on. And if we have children who are suffering emotionally or psychologically, they're likely to fall behind in their academic work as well. So it's, 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 it's almost like a vicious circle. And... I know after the lockdown in the spring, the minister set up the enhanced programme, but it was directed primarily at academic support for pupils who had fallen behind. And you in your presentation suggest that the prioritisation should be for emotional support. And uh, I mean, 
I, I'm of the view, and I'm just putting this suggestion to you, that what we actually need, uh, and I know there's the discussion, and Chris raised it with you, about, uh, you know, resetting the school uh, year here uh, and, and sort of cancelling this year and start again next uh, school year. But I'm putting a suggestion that, that what we really need is a, a, an enhanced engage program, you know, uh, 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 engage on steroids, if you like, that focuses on both aspects of the problems that are going to exist in the new school year of children having fallen behind academically and others suffering uh, uh, from emotional or psychological problems. Uh, what, what would your view be on that? And uh, I, I suppose also I wanted to ask you in your role as the mental health champion, uh, what proposals would you put to the uh, education minister to try and deal with the problems that we're going to be left with? Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Professor, just before I bring you in there, Pat, just to give you a heads up, that's about three and a half minutes of your seven, okay, just to no. let you know in terms of your follow-up questions. Thank no. you. Go ahead there. Okay, that that's grand. No, good, very, very good points. You're right. We, you know, and I'm not saying that that we shouldn't be doing the catch up stuff. We shouldn't be doing the education stuff. Um, I think it's about the order in which the, it's done. Um, I I think that there you're right. There are the, the same children who are behind, or the, the children who are probably at most risk of having mental health problems. You know, the, we know these things overlap and, and come together, um, and we have this layering um, of of disadvantage, of the digital divide, of poverty, of inequality, or the, the the effects of inequality, and then mental health problems and adversity and difficulties in the home too, um, and. I, I agree the education is just it's so it's so important and it's so important that we help our children catch up. What I'm ad, what I'm sort of saying is that though the mental health stuff needs to come first, um, and we, we need to really solely focus on that for a wee while and to, so that we can get the trust of our children back as well. And then we're best placed to do that other work. So it really requires that strong focus at the start of um on, on the children's well being and mental health. And then you'll be in the best position to to work with the children and, and work out what is um, where they're falling behind and how to start to, to make that good and repair that. So it, it's about the order in which these things happen. And it's about developing that relationship of trust with the child, really connecting, really understanding where that child is emotionally. Um, so that we can reduce that chronic anxiety that a lot of children are feeling. Um, and then it, it, we won't even be able to assess their, their educational um, attainment and where they are educationally if they're highly anxious. You know, it'll give us false ratings and false results essentially too. So I, I think of, it's just a few weeks of that reconnection is necessary first um, before we before we do the education stuff. But it's not one or the other, both both need to happen, in my view, and children will be reassured actually when we say when we say to them we're going to work on the educational stuff, but we need to focus on you because we care about you. That will make a big difference, you know, um, and it'll reassure them. But I think the mental health stuff needs to, needs really to be the priority. If you think of how the brain and, and the body are, you know, that mental health stuff needs to be the priority, and then we can we can get them the back end of their school work, and it'll work much better. Okay, th thanks for that, uh, Siobhan. And just by coincidence, I got a response back from the department this morning in regard to a question I had asked about the Education Restart Programme. And, and the budget for 2021 was £5 million. Uh, and that, that was spread over, you know, a 1,000 schools for pupils and staff. I mean, to me, that sounds woefully inadequate for the problems we're going to face in the coming year. Would you agree with that? It, it doesn't sound very high, to be honest, Pat. You know, and that, that is disappointing. Um, but I also need to point out that it's not just about the money that we put into this. It's about really capitalising um, on the, the many, many groups that are already out there who are just mad keen to be working with children and using the money very, very wisely. You know, our teachers are really stretched right now and I don't think it's appropriate to pile this work on top of teachers or even supply teachers. I think we need to think more creatively about the community and voluntary sector, about the sporting organisations that that are there who want to help and we want to use their expertise as well. So it's 
it's not just about money, it's about what we spend the money on and it's about um, using the, the groups that are already there, the people that were already paying to do things, you know, and invest in a very creative and wise way too. Okay, thanks for that. Okay. Right time for a final quick one, Chris. Uh, you're out of time. If you make it very quick, Pat, we'll give you your first meetings. Uh, Grace here, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. I just want, I just want to raise another issue around the, the negative discussion there has been around the value of secondary schools. And and I think the, the minister's uh, uh, narrative around this was, was very, very unhelpful when he said that uh, the cancellation of transfer tests would uh, severely limit children's uh, opportunities. So what can be done, do you think, to combat the harmful narrative uh, and support self-esteem of, of pupils who are affected by this? Thanks. Thanks, Pat. That's a really, really good question. I was concerned about the self-esteem of our secondary school students and how they would interpret what's been said, you know, and all of the public discussion. Um, I think I think it's just really important that parents let their children know that they're valued and loved and that we communicate um, the to your children that how, how much we how much we respect them and how much we value the work they do and and regardless of what school they're in, all our schools are good schools in Northern Ireland and, and we need to just enforce that at, at every enforce that message in any way that we can. And I think a really good summer program for all our children would be a way of communicating um, our gratitude for what they've sacrificed, you know, to protect the older members of our society who are much more at risk of this illness. So I think there, there's a lot we can do and we should we should really look in terms of the education review. We need to look at this anyway, you know, um, because this idea that we have two types of schools and that one might possibly limit your opportunity, that, that's just not acceptable. You know, that narrative is not acceptable. So, um, so, so, yeah. I think we all need to, to be aware of the effect that our words and have on children in various different settings and and change change that for them. Okay, thanks for having uh, Thank you. Thanks. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Come with us, Robin. Can't hear Robin there. Um, can I try Daniel McCrossan? And um, we'll make sure we get Robin back there as soon as we can. Yeah, yes, sure. Dan uh, Daniel, go ahead and I'll bring Robin in immediately afterwards once we re-establish connection. I think, yeah, Thanks, Daniel. I think, the system, I think the system's playing up. It's cut me out two or three times. Um, Siobhan, very good to uh, see you and, and, and have you at committee and thank you for your presentation. I, I've been following you uh, closely and the great work that you're doing and the very clear uh, signals and warnings that you've been putting out about the impact that this pandemic has had on our children and young people right across uh, Northern Ireland and, uh, and I appreciate uh, the... Uh, efforts that you've put into, I suppose, directing the minister, if you like, uh, that, 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 that is, is on the wrong side of a few things in terms of where uh, children have been affected and impacted. So I think your work has been invaluable in the short time you're there, and it's very much appreciated. It's good to have you there. Uh, Straight to questions, um, your paper sits out clearly and convincingly the relationship between prolonged childhood stress uh, and lack of capacity to learn. You're all, you also outlined significant emerging well-being issues that the COVID-19 pandemic is inflicting on our children and young people and identify the most at-risk groups for us. This is helpful. Siobhan, amongst these groups are children who will transfer uh, to uh, uh, at 11 to post-primary education, in particular children you identify at the subgroup who may now perceive that school admission criteria uh, is unfair. What do you think can be done about this now? And secondly, uh, for future benefit, how do you think this transfer process could have been handled better? I'm asking this as I have in uh, mind not only the current year seven children who uh, have yet to be placed in post-primary schools, but also the year six children who have everything still in front of them. 
Yeah, these are really good questions and I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm not an educationalist, but it seems that the proposals that were set out by the Children's Commissioner and others last, I think it was even in April, certainly before last summer, around uh, the need for a, a process of continuous assessment of, of this group or some way of using the data that, that was obtained through the repeated tests that had that been undertaken over the, the past year, that that would have been a much better way of establishing that criteria for admission to the different schools. Um, and, you know, but this is going to require us to turn back time and that's not possible. Um, I think another another way of approaching this would be that, that, that pupils and their parents and then work with teachers to to discuss the, the, the child's needs educationally and to make a decision on that basis uh, around what school would, would best suit that child, you know, so it's more negotiated. Again, this is not going to be appropriate for all children who have their hearts set in particular schools, you know, and um, the, the whole system needs to be looked at in, in this next review. The idea that, that there, again, that there are two types of schools and that this test differentiates between two types of children um, that just seems to be not fit for a purpose it's not you know it's, it's not what we it's, it's not what we're thinking nowadays about education and and everything so really I think the, the review of education is going to be really important um, and, and this year's p6 group they've missed out so much education yeah. too um, that we need to, we need to to have a replacement option for them as well. We need to be you know the the exam the pressure of setting those high stakes exams is huge, and I think for children to be spared that you know that that is protecting their mental health in some way if they, they don't have to do that. But we do need to replace it with something that, that people find acceptable because that that feeling of unfairness is leading to rumination and anxiety and mental health problems as well you know so all of these things need to be dealt with um, and they need to be dealt with now but I don't think asking this group of children you know we talk about them as pupils they're 10 year old children yep. sitting high sex exams they're the only children now and young people in Northern Ireland that will be sitting exams um, that, that that's really that's a huge stress and then remember a lot of them have also been spared that experience of failure not getting yep. into the school that they wanted we know that has a lifelong impact as well it's just impossible to say at the stage which children that would have been you know and the parents a lot of parents seem to think that their their children wouldn't have been in that category but we know every year that many many are so yeah. there's a lot of difficulties with this and as i say i don't have all the answers but but you know there were proposals put in place set out last year and we need to return to to those suggestions and work our way through this yeah you're absolutely right Siobhan uh, I, 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 worry, I worry for all our children particularly those 10 year olds and 11 year olds that have been so severely impacted but absolutely the, 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 those of this year group that are sitting this exam next year because they've been so badly impacted uh, and, and, and it's going to have a huge huge impact on them and I've no doubt it already is and you're hearing it from parents who are seeing 11 and 10 year olds in tears like that should not be what we want for our children in Northern Ireland and it's very clear it's having an impact on family life as well uh, I have another question Siobhan I know the chair is going to be your proposal for uh, education restart centre initially around uh, meeting children's physical needs, as in safety, food, exercise, and sleep. Some people will see a number of these as essentially the role of the family rather than the school. No doubt both must play an important part, uh, as we'll agree, in order to ensure maximum buy in uh, from all key. Uh, stakeholders, including young people facing significant exams, such as A-levels in the summer of 2020. Would you outline how you see the partnership between home and school functioning? And uh, uh, along the way, tell us how long uh, you think initially means as initially uh, focusing on meeting uh, physical needs. <laughs> there are no exacts and absolutes and I can't, I, I'm afraid I'm not positioned to give you the exact uh, time scale and every child is different, you know. Um, what I would say is that um, of course, it's about what happens in the home fundamentally. But, you know, our children are at school or they're going to be at school for a large part of their day more than, you know, they would be sleeping, hopefully sleeping most of the time when they're at home. So um, we need to actually recognize that that school environment is absolutely crucial to you and their needs need to be met yeah. there. Um, and if you think of that sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's safety and psychological safety and physical security is fundamental and that needs to be put first. And then we need our leaders to feel safe and secure and, and they communicate that and children yeah. will mirror that. So if we look after our teachers and make everybody feel safe, then that, that's a building blocks for this. Um, 
But so schools and families need to work for, uh, schools need to reach out to families to find out what's yeah. been happening in the home. need to talk to kids about what's been happening in the home. And parents need to feel that they can communicate with their schools as well. So those lines of communication need to be opened right up. Um, and I'm talking about meetings between parents and teachers, a lot of time invested in that, just talking about I mean, really honest heart-to-heart conversations about what's been happening in that home if that's possible, and what, what life has been like for that child. And, you know, this is going to take a long time, Daniel. I, I don't think it can be achieved in a couple of weeks if we're no. going to try and do it right. You know? um, and I just worry that we rush into this education restart back at the books, catch up, yeah. you know, and the children are just suffering and stressed and they'll be left behind and we'll be left with more problems later, further down the line. You know, we can halt the tsunami of mental health problems. We can intervene early. These, these kids, are they're developing, you know, they could, we can re- help them rewire really, really quickly. It's a mm-hmm. small period of time when you look at their lifespan. But we can't just ignore and neglect what's happened to them over the past yeah, no. year. Like this. Totally agree. You know, uh, Daniel, that, that's Chair, fine. Chair, let you make I have a final really comment. Brief, Go ahead. Have, Go yes, ahead. Go a really ahead. brief question. Yeah. Thank you, Thatch. Siobhan, in your assessment, do you, do our teachers receive the necessary initial training and in-service training to enable them to support sufficiently the well-being um, of our children and young people? The phone rang in the middle. I don't, of I don't know about the curriculum right now. I suspect not. But I know the Mental Health and Schools Framework has a plan to start to look at that and address that. You know, But um, a lot of the teachers that I know are very well fluid into this stuff and they've educated them. Else, you know, and there's many, many thousands of teachers across Northern Ireland who know about this stuff. But yeah, the curriculum does need to be looked at, and I think that's going to be happening as part of the framework too. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Can Thanks, I try you. try Robin Newton, MLA, again there? Is Robin back? I don't see him there actually. Okay, I move to Robbie Butler uh, on the promise that Robin will be brought in as soon as we can reconnect him. Robbie. Morning, Chair. Um, morning, Siobhan. I, I always want to call you champ, but then I think if I call you champ, Rocky Balboa just comes in everybody's head. Just going to call you champ and take it as a compliment. Um, well done for everything that you've done since you've been appointed as the interim mental health champion. Don't know how that's going to pan out when, when they go out for the free champion. I hope it's you. I hope you put in for it. I hope you're interested because I think the start that you've made, um, your, your pedigree is, is perfect. It's, it's impeccable and your input in across everywhere that I've engaged with you has been superb, Siobhan. And you face one of the things that I've noticed on social media, what everybody's facing and young people are facing incredibly, and you're being trolled. Uh, You are being uh, hammered in some ways. Sometimes we get it as politicians. It's not acceptable for anybody. I think it's abhorrent, uh, some of the stuff that I've seen. So our young people have never been more connected. Now, there's a price to be paid for that connection that is there and social media has a massive part to play. And one of the things that I, I, I have to be critical of is um, sometimes the, uh, the, the the political shenanigans that goes on, which doesn't actually help the problems that are being experienced by young people. And you will have been on many uh, forums, like I have been for this last four or five years, and repeatedly the number one issue that young people have raised is their uh, number one issue, the number one issue is their number one issue, is mental health. So COVID has obviously doubled down on that. Um, it, it, and this, I'm not asking you to give advice to politicians, I'm just asking for advice perhaps in and around the social media piece at the moment. What what can we do? Because it's a massive, it's a, it's a, it's, it can be a force for good as well. Is there anything that we can be very deliberate and intentional about? What sort of a message can we go for that platform where we can start to build into what you're conveying as a plan today to start tack- looking at that resilience and starting looking at that build back program for young people and actually get that 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 resilience that we need for the return to next year's curriculum? Okay, well, so for young people on social media, um, I it's really about keeping the lines of communication open with their young people. So between parents and their children and the relationship between the parent and the child is absolutely crucial so that whenever there's problems in social media that parents actually know about them and that you know parents know which sites that, that their children are on so that curiosity that genuine interest the parents need to have in what their children are doing there's there's no program that is going to replace that you know and parents need to know that that's part of their job is to understand um who you know in my generation when i was growing up my parents would always be looking at who who, who is she associating with whose houses is she going to you know what are they like and it's the same social media so i i think parents need to understand that the the monitoring their, their children's social media use and understanding what's happening there is just part of part of their job as parents part of parenting um and young people 
and 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 their resilience and their emotional regulation and their um, programs that they're getting. This is again about social relationships and about navigating social relationships. Their relationships online, you know, which makes them difficult. And often there's pictures and things like that that are, that accompany them, which which makes it even more difficult. But I think there, there's ways of preparing young people for that world, and and helping them um, and helping them navigate it. You know, and the best resilience programs will will actually do that. Will We'll talk about you know the different ways in which we connect with people and the relationships we have with people and and this whole online world where where people who don't even know anything about you that that's why I you know like people are angry and they're coming at this from a place of anger and they're saying things that you know they wouldn't say to you in real life and they're scared a lot of stuff that happens in social media a lot of that trolling is not it's not about me it's about somebody who's really anxious and they're looking for who's who's the aggressor here who do i need to fight against you know again it's about that biological stress response the fight or flight process that that sets a person up to find out who's whose fault it is and look if i have to absorb it that that's grand somebody else is not getting it there's no problem i i'm just a face and a screen like as far as they're concerned they know they know very little about me so it's giving children that resilience and helping them understand what all of these um media social media outlets are and helping them with with real connections real relationships and sometimes those relationships are online and a lot of them are over zoom right now you know, I can remember, if, you, if you don't mind right. it's really important to talk about the validation that we all seek whether you're an adult or a child 90 percent of what we do in social media is that we're seeking validation but unfortunately in social media unless you know the person where they're being it's like a perverse form of validation and then you seek and i mean if you could put up the word hope and you could put up the word hate and you can guarantee that hate is going to be troubled down and doubled down on and, and people in you know it's, it's just one of those things but i think out of all the things that you're saying that the role of the parent and the, and the relationship between teachers pupils and parents is, is incredibly important because teachers have a specific role to play predominantly in around education and a little bit of pastoral piece um, and then the, the, the engage or, uh, or whatever that's going to be the program when we get back um, I think there needs to be clear lines and, and you talked about the third sector the community and voluntary and I believe that you're right I think that's where we need to mobilize that whatever that's going to be in the curriculum just to go back on something if you want to maybe even share a little bit that I have a concern about so you talked about the neuroplasticity talked and then I know that you're big in trauma informed um, strategy okay so obviously we ha- do have vulnerable children we have children who are at spend a lot of time at home some of them in complex circumstances shall we say so that neuroplasticity is very real even in young, you know in young children can you maybe speak to how we can uh, equip teachers when they come back in terms of how do we identify those children that are in absolute need, you know, the critical ones, perhaps the ones that aren't saying too much, as opposed to those mm-hmm. that are saying a lot, you know, how do we how do we get down and find the most vulnerable uh, children at this point or, or, or even when we return? It, it starts with looking after you teachers to be honest because your teachers need to be in that safe and social that calm state so that they can recognize those subtle emotional cues from from the children that they're looking after you know so um, it all starts with with your leaders and then um and then they'll be best placed to sort of work out which children are are most in need and most at risk and to open up lines of communication with those children so you know you know yourself if you if your parents in a bad mood or if the leader's in a bad mood you're not going to go near them and you're certainly not going to start talking about the problems that you have so i actually think this starts with teacher well-being teachers need to feel safe so it 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 really is about making sure that our teachers are coming at this from from a place of safe and social and and that the environment and that means at the minute it means covid safe right Mm -hmm. so so with all of those things then the, the teachers can feel psychologically safe and they can have the space to have the conversation if you've got parents who are trying to work to a curriculum that is about trying to assess children and play and catch up and all of that stuff, none of this is going to happen. We need space and time. We need to be creative. We need parents and teachers that are doing things with their children um, and, and with the pupils so that, you know, we're drawing pictures, we're, we're, having, we're getting the kids out running about, and then the conversations will happen when we're all relaxed. But they're not to happen in those kind of really awkward environments where we're, we're focusing on schoolwork and catching up and all the languages about what people have missed you know and how bad this has all been you know we need to find a bit of the joy of it as well so I, I'm afraid it is back to basics and making sure that everybody's okay and thinking about that community neuroscience where the pack leaders are sending out those signals that everything's okay and then the conversation's happening and we work out 
about what's been going on behind the scenes. And then we link in with the GPs um, and all of the other community services for those kids who have um, health problems, mental health problems, chronic anxiety, even abuse, you know, like because there's, there's a reduction in referrals to social services seen across the piece. And those children are out there and they're suffering and they've been they've been hemmed in in situations where they're being abused and neglected. You know, we need to find those kids and, and get them help. And that needs to be our absolute priority, you know. I'm just finishing this. This isn't a question, Chair, because I know my time will probably be up. But I go, just want to go ahead. Go ahead. I've said this, I've said this a few times. You've on them. I mean, if, if I ever, if I was in politics and I uh, was as negative as, as, as many people are and can keep us in, and that's no critique of anybody in this committee, by the way. Um, I think what we fail to do is to make sure that we deliver some positivity. I would like to genuinely pay credit to the resilience of our young people because. Um, our young people are incredibly resilient. And what, what has shown in adversity through the two of the groups, particularly that you mentioned, which is Pure Mental A&I and the Secondary uh, Students' Union of Northern Ireland, and, and they're not the only ones. There's the Crisis Cafe as well, um, mm-hmm. and there are other groups which have engaged and they've shown, I don't know, I, I don't know they've, they've shown to me what the spread of this blended country is, is about and what they can do and what, what can happen. So I would, I, would, I would hope that the example that has been set and the, the initiatives that they have set out on actually might move this Lincoln place forward and take us into a new era of what we both want to see, which is the transformation of mental health uh, in Northern Ireland. And, and I believe it can happen. So just, just I would caution anybody to, to, to not you, by the way, because you're the prof, you know this. I'm just keen on this, that we also have to talk about the stuff that's good and the stuff that we're learning and the hope that is there, because there is hope. Uh, this is this is not right, and we will finish it properly. But um, thank you for your uh, show, uh, being on with us today, Siobhan. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Can I try Rob, Robin Newton, MLA? I think that's you, Robin. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I thank Professor O'Neill? She has raised, uh, I think, in her opening remarks, uh, huge challenges that, that uh, would be challenges there uh, for all of us. Uh, and I don't think it is just challenges that... Um, will be met by the education uh, committee or the education authority. I think it's challenges to, for society uh, as a whole <clears throat> in whatever this new arrangements are as we as we come out of the pandemic. I do agree with her. We do need to value all our pupils uh, at all levels, uh, and they are all import, important to us. Uh, can I pose just a, a, a few short questions, Chair? Um, Professor O'Neill, you, you'd indicated, you know, the lack of discipline, the lack of routine, the the uh, failure uh, at the moment of the uh, of our children to be in a com- competition with their peers in the school teams, uh, sports teams, or 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 whatever. And I think, you know, in terms of the academic sense. There will be children in our society who are receiving, at this moment in time, good home tuition by by their parents. And there will be those children who are receiving little uh, support uh, working at home. In terms of uh, those two children, will have those children returning to school, however that is achieved, in a safe environment, but very much at two distinct, different uh, levels of, of achievement. Can I raise that one with you in terms of them returning to the classroom? Can I raise the issue of the, the some of the aspects that you have raised are not just pertinent to the health situation we are in at the moment, but indeed may require issues to be addressed around the longer term training for teachers uh, and uh, gaining them expertise in the mental health area um, as they go through their normal, uh, whatever normal will be uh, in the future. And then can I ask you about harnessing the the expertise uh, 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 during the summer uh, and how you might uh, expect to see the outworkings of that, the practicalities of that, uh, and what those programs might might uh, include over over the, the the summer period. 
Okay, okay. So so the first one there um was around teacher training, I think, you know, and the and the teacher training curriculum. So that, that was one of them. And I'll, I'll take that one first. I mean, that's um that's something that is addressed within the mental health and schools framework. Um I I think a lot of the teachers who are going into teacher training now recognize the importance of young people's mental health and well being as part of what they do. So I can see this very much on the ground. Teachers know that it's part of their job. And, you know, you'll, you'll see lots of teachers communicating on social media and talking about this part of the role. So I think that shift is already starting to happen. Um, and it's it's about, yes, the change in the curriculum. But we're not trying to make teachers into mental health experts. I think it's really important to say that the role only goes so far. It's about, you know, creating an environment where those problems that young people have, that they can be communicated and that teachers can get the, the young people and the children the, the right support you know, and the teachers need to be surrounded then by a structure and a network of supports that they can refer young people and children to. So there's no point in opening up these conversations if there's nowhere for the children to go. So I think it all has to fit along with the the framework and then and the mental health strategy too. Um, so so that's really important. I mean, th- there is lots of uh, work that will be done as part of the the framework to introduce resilience programs, specific programs and classes into schools. And of course, the the teachers who deliver those classes will be teachers with a particular interest in this area who have received a different type of training and they're prepared for that so I think we're not trying to say that all teachers need to become mental health experts or counsellors or specialists you know, that's not their job but that's not what they're good at and that's a distraction actually from what we need them to do for our young people so that they can you know achieve educationally and, and get their grades so I think it's really important to say that I'm not calling for teachers to replace counsellors to replace uh, mental health workers or to or indeed to replace parents who are children's first teachers. So what happens in the home and the community is still absolutely vital to that. Um, the other point that, that I've made from your questions is around some some sort of summer program, what that might look like. I think it starts with um, joining together t- of, of all the different departments to make sure, and I'm thinking education, health and communities with the three that I wrote to to ensure that there's a bit of funding that that supports this this endeavour, and then it's about reaching out to all of those community organisations who are there, who have in the past provided some programmes, who have run programmes that are like this, and there are many many lists that we can come up with. You know, the major sporting organisations are out there, and they're doing that, and and then somebody getting together a big list of what what will be happening, what can happen, and starting to make sure then that every community has something and that there's funding for that but what I'm really saying is the planning for that needs to start straight away because it can take a few months for all of that work to be done and you know we're taking a bit of a risk if we do something like this because we don't know where we're going to be with the virus when it comes to September um, or sorry when it even comes to June you know that's kind of time but what we're talking about here but the reality is most of our children won't get going on holidays the parents will still many of them will still be working from home so you know we'll be putting children back into that situation some of them will get very good summer experiences but many of them won't and the ones that won't are the ones that have been disadvantaged and are most at risk so it's just about being more strategic and then hopefully trying to work with primary care or some other um, way of linking into health services so that whenever we identify a child who needs um, who needs help with their with their dental work? Who who has put on weight stuff stuff like that? You know the physical health problems that we that we see then if we can do a quick screen and we can get them treated and referred um, very very quickly. So that's the kind of thing I have in mind. It's really about working together and joining up different organisations. And I know that they are so open to this. It's just about leadership and somebody to take it forward and to start that planning process right now. Um, and it would be it would just be such a lovely way for our children children to spend the summer and a great thing to say that we give give this to our children in Northern Ireland you know I think that would be lovely so remind me if there were questions or parts of your questions Robin that I didn't answer as well yeah final final round up Robin yeah thank you yeah uh, Tara I do uh, I do see uh, problems when the children who have received support over the uh, lockdown period return to the classroom children in the same class who haven't received support and the difficulties that the uh, teachers will have um, in in bringing those two groups to, together. But you, you used the word hope. I do think we, I agree with you. We very much need to give our, our children hope. 
at the extreme end, I do see, um, and, and I, I have contact with some schools where there is a, a need to have the family intervention teams working uh, strongly with, with, with the teachers. Uh, and as one parent uh, put it, sorry, as one uh, principal put it to me, the family intervention teams are not adequately resourced. It's not great work and you get high turnover of uh, staff within the family intervention teams, difficult work. Um, and how we address that issue of providing the children at the more difficult end with that hope that they can go forward uh, and achieve uh, both academically and socially uh, within the school environment. Yeah, well, I, th I think one of the things there is we need to make our services fit for purpose. We actually need to, to fund the services so they can deliver the interventions to the families. And, and the money that we invest there is money that's really well spent. It'll pay dividends further down the line. So there's, you know, there's no substitute for good investment and, and, and good services and, and properly supported services. In relation to the groups that are behind and how they're all going to be mixed in together, I think... I think every child really will be unique because some children will be behind will be really behind in some areas and, and parents will say themselves that you know they're happy doing the English or whatever and they're not so keen in the math so they're happy with with this part of it and you know so so the children will all be at different stages um so I think it's really it's really important we don't label children as well we do this in a way that's compassionate and non stigmatizing and we do a kind of a you know, find out what each child, where each child is, and then put in place a package for that that individual child. And there'll be no child who's had the perfect experience. And I'm actually particularly worried about the children where they've the homeschooling's been really strict. You know, that authoritarian parenting style is actually, you know, quite detrimental to children's mental health too. So where the children have been sitting at the books all day, maybe they're the ones that, that actually need a wee bit of help and a wee okay. bit of downtime bit more play. I don't know. It's really hard to get this right. Homeschooling hasn't. Most families will tell you it, it's it's not been a great success. But families are doing their best, you know, and that's the most important thing. And we just need to find out where each child is, and try and get away from the language that stigmatizes children and says that some are behind and others are not behind. You know, but we know the reality okay. is that children in households will, will okay. really have suffered. And Need extra support for that group too. Sorry, I'm talking too much. No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, morning, Siobhan. Um, thank you very much for your time and your, your input this morning. Um, Siobhan, uh, I know that you'll be aware of this because I heard you speak in Spectrum Centre um, you know, uh, last year, whatever, around the issue of mental health, suicide awareness, general wellbeing. These are huge issues. I call it the other pandemic that, that, that my constituents mm -hmm. are facing. Uh, you know, areas like Ardoin and Shankill and so on, and so many young people uh, taking their own lives and, and, and under huge pressure and mental health, a huge, huge issue. Um, just want to expand on some of the, the, the questioning of Robin uh, pursued there in terms of, you know, the aftermath of this. Um, you know, we've had the technological shortfall in terms of young people in communities that are deprived. And I represent one of the most deprived constituencies, not just in Northern Ireland, but the United Kingdom. So the joint upness of all of this is hugely important. Um, and you talked about education and sport uh, and so on. And, and they're just the, the, the ability just to go out and be children again, I suppose, and, and enjoy themselves. I think that's hugely important for their mental well-being. Um, uh, and the mental health needs to come first to get them rebooted, it's sensed, for the, for the classroom. So how do we get the joined upness you talked about there? Uh, I'm involved um, in, in youth work through the Scout Association. And obviously, it hasn't just been the classroom that's been closed to these kids. You know, we, we have been able to function properly as the boys brigade, the, the guides and the, the GB and so on. Uh, youth football, other sports as well, haven't been able to function either. So you have the classroom and you have other sort of outdoor and, and sporting pursuits that are curtailed as well at the moment. How do we get the joined up that we need to take this forward and address this huge issue uh, of mental health that's going to be even bigger at the other end of this? Um, good question again. The joined upness will happen when there's leadership and coordination. So we need somebody ownership. We need a decision. We need a, we need the world to do it first of all. 
um, we, we need to make sure that everybody's all on message that understands how important the mental health and well-being and that is our priority. So the messages need to get out there too. But it is about the the leadership, and the coordination. Um, and a bit of funding is, is actually what's required. That's not a huge amount of funding, actually, but I think um, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting was three departments, communities, health and education would work together to put a service and work together to um, a team uh, that's led by someone that would make the plans, that would get, get all the relevant groups together. Because once you have that, you have coordination and leadership, you can bring everybody up from board. And so I, I, think, I think that's really what we need, what we need to bring to this forward to get that relevance that you put William, can I, can I just intervene briefly? Apologies, just to check that everyone else uh, is not answering or asking a question or answering a question uh, puts their device on mute as there is a fair bit of background noise there. Thanks, William. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my, I guess my point is you, you, you talk about you know, strong departments like health, education, communities are obviously crucial around this. The public health authority, organizations like um, you know, integrated services here in Greater Shankill and then Sammy and Tammy, the sort of the football clubs uh, on either side of, of the community, all doing hugely valuable and important work. But but who then, Siobhan, is the convener for all of this to make sure it happens? You know, I mean, is there a scope for you to have conversations with the Children's Commissioner and so on, take these things to order all the key people? I, I, I'm just concerned that everybody will think it's a good idea and everybody thinks it should be done. But we need somebody to actually put it together and convene it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think yes, um, it's it's something that, that that we would like to to be involved in. You know, we can start convening the meetings to work out who's going to lead it and who's best placed to lead it. We need uh, we need the commitment to fund it then, and then I think we can find a place for this when we have that. But at the minute, you know, all the people that you're talking about are looking at the to do that the momentum to start with with the funding. But um I, yeah, there, there's various different areas in which this could be led. Um public health are pandemic right now and that's not the right so you know we need to work on the services to do the new has the services to do. Yeah, I think I think uh, the key thing for me is that we've got to get um regional government departments and local government uh, and those that are involved in this sector working together because you know, sometimes I almost think there are too many players in the field around mental health and, and, and general well-being, mental health, uh, and so on. Because um, it's almost as if you know, they're, they're you know, getting a good agreed strategy of every, across everyone is not easy at the best of times, and it's particularly acute now. So I think I think that's something we need to give some thought to. This is not a solution that should be in a case of. Let's read to the education minister. It cuts across government, it, it health, uh, in terms of the PHA, uh, communities and local government. And I think we need to give some thought to, to who convenes all of that. Uh, Chair, that's me. And thank you very much, Siobhan, for your candour uh, this morning as ever. Thank you. Thanks, William. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Nicola there? No. Okay, I'll bring in Justin McNulty and we can return to, oh, there's Nicola there, is it? Thanks, Nicola. Yes, thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Chair. Um, Siobhan, thank you so much for your briefing today and for coming along um, this morning. As everyone has kind of said already, we all know how important just the mental health um, is at the minute and how like all of our mental health have been impacted by the COVID, by, by the pandemic, and um, in particular, our young people and even like how they've been educated, you know. So um, we really appreciate you coming in and for all your wise words and advice. Can I just touch upon, um, I think it was near the end of your briefing, you talked about, um, it was a survey from the Princess Trust about young people and basically losing hope in about their future and the, the hopelessness they're feeling at the minute. And even before the pandemic, we had a generation of young people whose prospects seemed worse than their parents. What do you think can be done to improve, um, first of all, to restore hope for young people and then to improve the lives and prospects? of young people in particular? 
Okay. Yeah. Really important finding. I don't know if there was a wee bit of feedback. If everybody could just check that their mics are on mute. Thanks. Um. So so yeah. Hope promoting hope, helping our young people feel that Northern Ireland is the place they want to have their lives. We don't want to be educating them and then for them want to leave. You know, and that that's what that's what a lot of them are planning. If you ask them, I think it starts back to with that line of communication between us and our young people. We need to keep asking them what they want. We need to keep communicating that they're valued, that they want to hear about what life is like for them. So that that is crucial to be involved in. And the children's minister is doing a great, a huge great work there because everything that they do is important for our young people. So I think that model needs to be you know, across all of the departments, the panel, young people's schools, giving young people to you know, making sure that they have a stake here and that they can influence things and change things. And once we start to involve them, they will have a um that we will start to create a society. So it's about involving them and about thinking about them and what we will be doing and how we were planning to to address the issues that they have raised. So that, that would be my start point. Let's keep them a part of this conversation. Siobhan, sorry, that line is very. I think what you said was about working across departments and getting the commission, um, children's commission involved, and that there. Uh, and maybe involving young people in the conversation. H have they been involved so far about you know, what kind of what, what the outlook is for them? Or how have well, they been involved? Um, these surveys, I suppose, are the way of involving them. Um, and that, that that's one bit. The the children's commissioner has regular meetings with with young people with the panel there, so they are very much involved. And as mental health champion, I'm taking every opportunity to reach young people, to talk to young people um, of all ages. And so I've had forums with the children's commissioner, sorry, with the um, Northern Ireland Youth Forum, with the Future Minds Group, with with all with all of the groups that are there. Um, including the Princess Trust and the, the young people that are part of their group. You know, young people are well able to tell us what they want. So we need a lot more of that. Yeah, absolutely agree. In fact, I'm sure everyone here has been engaging with their own constituents now too, and so have I. And right, it's great to hear from them. You just get a better kind of idea of exactly how it's affecting them. Um, just one final question, um, Siobhan. I was about the in terms of well-being and mental health. What do you think the effects are um, on children spending more time online and with like, on, on their IT devices in terms of mental health? Yeah, uh, most of the that uh, time online doesn't damage their mental health personally. Um, if they're online when they should be sleeping. Or if they're online so long that they're not getting the recommended amount of physical activity, then that can have an impact on their mental health. We also need to think about what are they doing when they're online. There's some really, really good stuff that they can do in this educational, even games, um, movies. Connecting with their friends online is really, really important. But mm -hmm. as, as I said earlier, if they're online and they're on social media and they're passive, whether they're, they're getting trolled or they're looking for social media or um, they're their self-esteem, you know, that can be damaging. So it's about what they're not doing when they're online and it's also um, about what's happening when they're, when they're not online and what they're engaging with, with that online world is like for them. And it's very, very complicated. Your parents shouldn't worry about an increase in screen time. It doesn't. You know, it's not going to be damaging, but if that's a negative, it's having a negative impact on that, on that child. And this again is about communicating with children, you know, people finding out what they're doing online, making sure they get enough sleep, that they open out of bed, and get enough activity in their day. And then once you have that, what's it be? Yeah, I suppose it's back to what you said before, but it being a parent's role to monitor it and ensure that they're keeping an eye on exactly what's going on online. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Members, I'm conscious that the audio quality uh, does seem to be struggling somewhat. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that. And um, if uh, sometimes if speakers 
uh, turn off their video. Sometimes that can assist the audio quality. Uh, I realize that's not an ideal option, but um, I'll try and keep speakers posted as to the quality of their audio and whether it might be necessary to try um, to turn video off for that. Uh, can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Siobhan, for your presence here today and for your work as mental health champion. Um, you've, been, you've been a ray of sunshine, ray of light, cutting through the gloom. Uh, you've destigmatized mental health. You've given children, young people, and adults hope. You've soothed people. So well done. Um, and you recognize the power of words. And you recognize the power of imagery. And I'll praise you on your beautiful camellias behind you. There. They are soothing the scene. I wish some of our political leaders would recognize the power of their words. I wish some of our political leaders would recognize how important it is for them to soothe things now instead of inflaming things, which is happening too much at the moment. Um, so much of the focus, Siobhan, educationally has been on exams. So much of the focus has been on restart, on stop, closing schools, opening schools, on partially opening schools, but very little focus on how children are. Very little focus on how young people are doing. How are they keeping? How are they doing? Nobody's mentioning that. It's very, it's very, very concerning. And um, I've, I've been talking about this for a number of months now, Siobhan, and that is a recharge program. Now you mentioned the recover program. It might, but the words I use, the words I, the word I've used is a recharge program. One where I've asked the minister to bring to, to get, bring about. Uh, all overarching program which includes emo emotional recovery for children, mental recovery for children, socialization, social recovery for children, and kids who haven't been socially participating for months. Um, they need to re-socialize, they need a, so a social recovery program, a physical recovery program, and one that helps them catch up academically. What are your thoughts around that and how that could be structured and how that could be resourced, Siobhan? Okay, this is this is nearly exactly what I'm saying. We're just using different language. We this happens a lot. You know, we use different language for, for the same thing. We call it different, we use different words, we have different um expressions, but I think we're we're both talking about exactly the same thing. Um I I think we need to use the school day for it though. That's what I would say. It, it's it's going to have to be part of the school day actually at the start. And it's going to be like a curriculum. We could call it a curriculum, but it's not a, an educational curriculum. It's a well being curriculum with, with some interventions in there as well. And there's lots of psychologists and psychiatrists would have the same kind of would be on the same lines and it's about promoting those reconnections with the teachers. So for me it starts with it might need a bit of resourcing, but it starts with actually making sure our teachers that, that are there that are going back into the schools they feel safe and secure and that their well being is looked after and that they that you know that, that they're in the best place possible to come in and support um children and young people so that the line of communication can be open and we can start to make those connections and refoster those connections. Um, the school environment's good. The schools are going to be closed in the summer, so that's why I think we need to be doing something in the summer. We can't put them back at home again. Um, and I think the, the investment should come from communities, health and education, as I've said, because these are issues that affect all of those three areas. It can come from wider than that. Um, it, it's really, it doesn't really matter where the money comes from. Everybody benefits when we do this across society. You know, we need these these young people now to be performing, you know, to be setting up businesses, to be staying in Northern Ireland, to be working here to boost the economy, to get us back after this pandemic so that we can all recover as a society. So these are the group of young people that we need to invest in. So yes, it's going to take a bit of creative thinking, but it, it, for me, it's got to be part of the school day. And then with the summer, the skills are off. We need, we need to be doing something there that's much more structured, and that's it's going to take it's going to take a bit of money. But um, I think when you, when you look at what money we've spent already, this is it's not a huge amount that we're talking about. And that's so important. Yes, absolutely. And I think the engage program, which you mentioned, that has already been introduced, uh, Siobhan, it amounts to six p per day per pupil in some schools. So that wouldn't be sufficient in my mind. But I won't dwell on that. Um, or, you know, I'm putting myself in the shoes of young people and as a kid the thing that was most important to me 
was being out and about and being active, playing football in the backfield, playing Gaelic, playing any sport, playing soccer, playing sport, being physically active. And I was so part, it was just who I was as a child. That's been mm -hmm. ripped and stripped away from children. How devastating an impact is that going to have on children's physical health, mental and health, emotional health? They're all interlinked. And how can that be addressed pronto? Because do we have to wait for another year before children can, can be, become active again? How, does that, how can that be addressed and how can that be led and who will that be led by? I know the sports forum are doing great work behind the scenes working with the governing bodies, but that needs to be, to be, that needs to be grabbed and grasped. That needs, you need, that needs to be grasped now to get children active again. Otherwise, the repercussions of this are going to be so, so serious down the line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and a strategic approach is what we need. When I, when I say a strategic approach, we need to actually set out what our goals are. Our goals are to make sure that our children are more active because that's so important we need to and, and the physical activity recommendations are there you know it's over an hour a day that's what our children need of intense physical activity so that's what our goal should be and then we need to work out how we're going to build that in um, and it's not just about physical health it's also about um, not just about physical activity it's about diet as well we need to make we need to bring our kids back a lot of them have have been at home and they've been comfort eating and eating lots of lovely food that we give them to try and make them feel good about themselves but this is not good for their physical health sometimes as well so we need to actually prioritize diet as well so diet and exercise and then the emotional regulation talking about our feelings working through your feelings problem solving um getting rid of that stress response so we can problem solve those are the things that we need strategically to set as our goal um and once you have that as your goal that's what you're driving towards and then you look at what well, what's already happening so what organizations exist in the various different communities and join those up um but create a school curriculum uh, that in includes all of this stuff. And I think we need to be checking and, and making sure that our young people and children are getting enough sleep. But if we put everything else in place, they will get that. Um, but that, that's your physical, that's your foundation for, for everything else. So I think strategic, is, that's where we need to be. And know that if we do this stuff right, the education stuff, the achievement, the entrepreneurship, the creativity, that will all come behind it. It will just absolutely flow on from it. So um, let, let's get a strategy, but let's make short-term plans too. Strategies can take away to, you know, we need to we need to be working over the next year to, to really get everything up. But but a program in the summer would make a big difference. Education restart focusing on a wellbeing curriculum would, would be a good start there as well, um, right now, straight away. Sean, Sean this, this word of stress, if you mentioned so many times, keeping stress away from children, and I don't, I don't agree with that. Stress is good. You can't build your muscles without stressing your muscles. So children need to understand stress is good, but obviously in manageable amounts. Um, but I still, I hark back to this physical education piece, and it's not just physical education, sorry, it doesn't necessarily specifically relate to schools. Children need to be active, and say one hour a day, for me as a child, one hour a day inactivity would have been massive. So one hour day to me is, for children is not enough. It's, it needs to be more. Um, how can this be addressed now where children can now get access to physical activity, to sport in some capacity safely? How can that be grasped and managed now? In the, in the well, that's sense? right. Yeah, well, this is about um, opening back up, opening sports centres, opening leisure centres, allowing sports clubs to, to recommence training. Um, you know, and, and we need to look at where we are in terms of the spread of the virus and the R rates and everything else. But again, these things need to be prioritised along with the reopening of schools. Um, but, you know, it's not my job to say when that should happen or what, you know, where we need to be before that can happen. But I think we need we need to be urging our leaders to make sure that that, that, that sport is is really started as soon as possible and once we have sport closed we need to make sure that the organizations who are delivering these services that they can do what they do online or try and replace this in some way but there is no substitute you're absolutely right there's no substitute for that um activity and that group activity and everything that that would bring is is really important but you know i i'm not anti-lockdown i think it's important to say that i think we need these but whenever it's safe to do so this this must be our absolute priority and you know a lot of the team sports they, they're very very important but we can't forget the the stuff that tends to to attract our females you know when they have lower levels of physical activity and higher rates of mental health problems in males and that stuff like our dance classes our, our women's sports i've had examples brought to me where, where the girls training has stopped and the boys training has continued you know those sorts of those sorts of things that, that that's not on either so we need to look at activity in every single sense and even 
think getting the schools are open, you know, you're opening up opportunities there for physical activity because, you know, young people will be walking to school and walking home again and walking between classes. So all of that needs to be improved and parents need to be aware of the importance of physical activity for their children's mental health as well because then they can start to try and do this and build this in to everything else that they're doing at home. Um, okay, Justin. Final, final point, Justin. Yeah, they're, they're undoubtedly interlinked. Mental uh, well-being is undoubtedly linked with your physical well-being, and that's why I so, so firmly support the reignition of uh, physical activity for kids in school and elsewhere when it can be safe to do so. And um, I, I reckon it's so, so crucially important. So, Siobhan, listen, thank you very much for your, for your uh, presence here today and for being that, that ray of sunshine lighting up the gloom. So, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank uh, you. All right. Can indeed go ahead. The fine quality is not good. Uh, can, I, can I thank uh, Professor O'Neill for her presentation? Very relevant to where we are. It presents challenges on how we assist school children to get back to normality uh, coming out of the pan pandemic, and I would congratulate her on her enthusiastic and informative responses so far. Uh, could I ask, what are your thoughts on stress resulting from outside school life? Already touched upon by Nicola, I know, but I, I, I couldn't hear the response because of poor, poor quality. Uh, I know I worked in a newspaper environment, uh, traditionally a late night, and I was going home after spending 12 hours in front of a computer with a tired body and an active mind, and it wasn't a good combination for sleep. Uh, our children and young people are spending a lot of time uh, on social media, on, on, on gaming, uh, video gaming, on Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think that the effect of activity like that is having on the anxiety levels and mental stress put on our young children by that type of, type of activity, probably late into the afternoon or the evening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the main, um, you know, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the psychology organisations um, would really be unanimous in saying that it, it's not going to harm young people's mental health per se, you know, unless it really has taken up all of all of their time. And um, you know, parents shouldn't be worried about the, the effect of screen time. We're all on online a lot more right now, so this is not going to damage their their mental health or cause brain damage. But we do need to be very careful and look at what children are doing when they are online, and what they're not doing when they're not online. So, um, so, so what what they're not doing? So, if they're missing out on sleep, if they're online late at night, and they have that, and and it's stress, it's emotional arousal. Really, you know, they're excited and they can't sleep, and their brain's rating. That is going to get in the world sleep. But you know, if they're on, if they're they're doing calming meditations and things in the evening, then that might be. It. Positive, positive impact on their sleep. So think about what what they're doing, and um, certainly if they're online in the middle of the night, then they're not they're not sleeping. And sleep is so fundamental and important to mental health. Um, and also think about what what they're doing in terms of their social media. So if they are being bullied online, or if they're looking at imagery and things that will have a negative impact on their mental health, then of course that's going to be damaging for them. So it's not so much about screen time per se. Um, sitting in front of a screen, you know, it's not going to damage you. It's about what you're doing when you're in front of that screen. And are you getting enough physical activity? Um, aside from that, you know, are you getting the exercise? Because that's really important. And are you getting enough sleep? And if it has taken over your whole world, or if it's one thing, I would be really worried if it was one computer game or one social media site that that person has become really, really, you know, that's not a balanced life. So again, it's about parents asking the question and, and there's no substitute for that relationship, but just being able to to be curious about what the child's doing online and looking over the shoulder, what are you up to? Conversations about what they're looking at um, are really, really important. But I don't think there's a need for a moral panic per se about online activity. Um, but but just, just keep an eye on it and make sure that you know what your kid's up to and that they can talk to you when they have problems. And I think you've got it nailed. And get get the physical activity and the sleep sorted as well. You know, if, if they're eating constantly sugary foods, that's going to raise their blood sugars as well. Diet is diet's part of this too. You know, so try and get all of those foundations right and keep up the relationship and the communication. Um, and it, should, it shouldn't do them too much harm over the long term. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Siobhan. I appreciate that. But m m many, uh, I think many youth sporting organizations already have close affiliations with their local schools. 
Uh, I also believe that school buildings should be available to the community and for community activity in the evenings and greater use during summer breaks. Uh, would you agree with me that a possible short-term start to reintroducing phys physical activity through local clubs, be they football, GAA, youth clubs, whatever, uh, could be got through, could be had through introducing open air school led summer activity programs in partnership with uh, local youth sporting clubs and existing youth organizations. That's a great idea, Morris. That's fantastic. That's exactly the kind of creative thinking that we need. You know, and, and, and my proposals I'm setting out sort of similar ideas, um, using what we have, using the, the, the people that we have in our community, never mind the buildings. We have so many people who want to help here. Who, and, and remember, if you give back, you get so much for, you know, out of that for your own mental health. So let's use all those people and the buildings and the communities, the great communities that we have here to start to, to, to do that summer program. And you're right. It, and, you know, our weather gets a wee bit better, not too much better, but it gets a wee bit better in the summer and we can be outside a bit more. And, you know, that's a more COVID safe environment too. So I think the summer does present us with an opportunity. And I would just hate to see our kids just lying on sofas all summer watching um, the screens like they have been all winter. You know, I'm not saying it's going to damage them, but wouldn't it be an awful shame if we couldn't use what will we have out there and create a much better experience and a health health giving experience for that for those young people? Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I know most of our uh our governing bodies are set up for sport through the winter time, but I think discussions have to be had with the, the governing bodies to allow uh, maybe the organisation of youth football leagues, GAA leagues, whatever, through the summer time to help us through this uh, current situation to get kids back to school. Uh, do I have time for another question, Chair? You do, Morris. Final question. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in your report, you see children here uh, had a higher level of mental illness prior to the pandemic and other parts of the UK. My thoughts about, uh, about the programme, like the one you've suggested, uh, they're excellent, but they must be targeted at those children who need more support to get involved in phys physical activity and properly funded to ensure that they're given the opportunity to take part in creative sp uh, sports or, or, or music, drama, art, whatever. But sometimes these activities need a contribution for musical instruments and materials, etc. What cost would you put on taking this programme forward and to look at such pursuits like music, arts, uh, drama, would you agree with me that an immediate start to reintroducing of phys physical activity as well as these uh, related activities could be done through uh, summer activities? Um, yes, I am not an economist, but I haven't done the sums just yet. Um, and I, I would love to work with people to design this and to cost it out properly. Um, and also to look at many of the voluntary and community organizations that are out there that, that, that will come at very little cost too. So I am sorry, I don't have that final figure for you about what this is going to cost, but let, let's work at this and let's, let's cost it out and see what it would cost. I think it, it you know, it's money that's very, very well spent. And I, I really like the fact that you've brought in creativity, art, music. Not all their, not all children see themselves as sporty, you know, but there will be a physical activity that will 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 attract almost all of our young people. You know, we, we just have to find out what that is. Every single one of our young people will have something that, that will drive them, that will get them energised, you know, and particularly our girls, we need to, to think about how we're going to make sure that they're physically active. But you're you're right. The the celebrations as well, community celebrations where we involve parents too. Um and the, the production of art, drama, music, all of those things are things we should be prioritizing and they are healing. They're therapeutic in and of themselves. You know, it will be enough for many young people just to have that and just to have that opportunity to connect and celebrate. And, and the feel good factor alone will be really, really, really important too. So let, let's try and do it and let's try and cost it out and see, see what sort of money we would need um, because this is really what I think we shouldn't be giving money back to um, back to London. We need to be using the money that we have available to us in the best way and, and that young generation really, really needs it right now. Thanks, Siobhan. You're on the same page as I am because uh, when, I, when I mention costs, I, I'm not putting it down as the cost. I'm putting it down as how much money do we need to spend to make it happen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks, Siobhan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Morris. Okay, members, that, that's that's all members. Uh, so, Siobhan, can I get say a very sincere thanks uh, for your time and contribution today, but also for all the work 
that you're doing to support good mental health for our children and young people. You, you've given us uh, a number of very helpful suggestions today that we'll take forward with the department and with the minister, and hopefully we can stay in touch with you throughout the, the duration of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for all the questions too. It's been great. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all the witnesses and add all members back into Spotlight and keep them there until our next item. Uh, Clark, do you wish to summarise any of the actions uh, or requests for additional information that are resulting from our briefing with the Mental Health Champion? Um, so, Clark, Clark, perhaps before you come in, can I just uh, remind everybody that's just been brought into the spotlight to stay on mute? Okay, unless you're speaking. Amy, thanks. Okay, um, so the people um, want to write to the uh, department, I expect, um, and just reflecting I think, uh, on this discussion um, and the uh, support. Um, for the Mental Health Champions uh, proposal of a summer program, um, which comprises uh, creative, sporting, outdoor, uh, uh, drama, music, um, various components, um, and an environment in which children can be relaxed, discuss their pandemic experience, and um, heal a little bit before they, they go back to the classroom um, later in the year. Um, so there were quite a few proposals in there about the timing of that and how mental health has to be dealt with first before um, children should get, or pupils should get back on the exam setting. Um, and a lot of uh, proposals about the organisation of uh, the sporting components and the outdoor components and how the community and voluntary sector, um, creative groups and sporting governing bodies can be involved in that. Um, so we can ask the department how much thinking has already gone into this, how much scoping there has been of such a program, um, and whether funding, um, the COVID funding uh, that might otherwise be surrendered, might be used for this. Um, so there were there were really a lot of uh, ideas in this session that I will summarise in, in, in the committee's correspondence to the department. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, Clark. That, that sounds constructive. Any other members wish to add to that or happy to agree that? Sure, sure. Uh, Robin, and then, Robin and then Justin, can I really ask anyone that's not speaking to use mute? I'm getting a lot of feedback here. I don't know why, but uh, let me bring Robin in and then Justin. Thanks. Sure, I, I, want, and I agree with the committee, Clark. So I agree there. So I think it's an excellent summary. But it's it, obviously a very complex situation in terms of the short time to get it, uh, potentially get it up and running. I wonder, uh, Chair, could we ask um, Professor O'Neill just for a short paper on her thinking and for that paper to be uh, forwarded also to the Health Minister and the Communities Minister in terms of the joined up thing, as she suggested, between each of the departments. Yeah, that sounds fair enough, Robin. I imagine the paper that she submitted could be adjusted accordingly to meet that need. Um, okay, bring Justin in. Yeah, very quickly, thanks, Chair. Can we write to the Minister asking for his? Uh, idea of what that recharge program as I call it but the, the Siobhan had different words for it we all have different words for it but essentially it's the same thing a recharge program what that actually how will that be structured and resourced for kids catching up and um recovery after this uh, lockdown so what what are the yeah. ministers ideas and what that will actually entail and how it'll be structured and how it'll be resourced and also how he has connected with teachers and uh, school leaders in terms of developing that program yeah yeah, I, th I think, think uh, Siobhan yourself, said, Justin, we're talking about the same thing. It's essentially a children and young people wellbeing recovery program. So, yeah, we'll, I'd be glad to uh, write to that effect. Any other members wish to come in? Pat, go ahead there. 
Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, and uh, I mean, there have been a couple of programs set up. There was the uh, Education Restart Program uh, aimed at helping well-being and so forth. And there was the Engage Program, which was more focused on helping those who had fallen behind academically. But given the magnitude of the problem that's going to face our, our children and young people when schools go back, I mean, this calls for something much bigger than just throwing a, a few extra quid at either of those programs. And it needs some sort of coherent, integrated strategy to deal with the problems that are going to be there. And, and, and I think it's a, a discussion we should have with the minister, uh, whether we write them beforehand or not. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm easy about that. But certainly the committee should have a view after having listened to Siobhan there uh, about how serious a problem we're facing, that the, the, the minister needs to come forward with some sort of integrated plan, strategy, whatever it's going to be called, uh, uh, so that the problems we're going to face can be dealt with in a, in a, in a, in a coherent way rather than just uh, throwing uh, money piecemeal at different aspects of the problems that are going to be there. Chair, can I come in there on the back of that? Yes, Daniel, go ahead there. Thanks, Pat. I can appreciate where Pat's coming from in relation to this, but I'm just totally frustrated with a lot of these uh, issues because a lot of them were brought about by the inaction and lack of leadership from the minister. So we're actually, the minister could resolve quite a lot of the issues uh, if he would just act sooner and put the interests of our children and young people first. The 11 plus GCSEs, A-levels, there's an endless list of how uh, these uh, uh, important areas have been mismanaged by the minister. And it's, it's not the liberty, it's the simple fact that he's taken too long to do things. And when he does, it's reactionary and then leaving people in limbo. So if the minister would step up sooner and show a bit of leadership, a lot of these issues could be averted very quickly. But I can, I can entirely appreciate where Pat's coming from in relation to uh, the need to uh, have a plan in place. Uh, but I have no faith that the minister is going to listen. He hasn't listened to this committee so far, and I don't think he's going to listen going forward. And I, I don't make any apologies for the bluntness of that. A lot of the issues facing young people in schools in particular are down to the failure of this minister to act chair. I wouldn't entirely disagree with you, Daniel. Uh, and I think there, have, there are examples of, of not listening to the committee and there are one or two where that has been the case i think in particular of uh, the work done in relation to period product provision for example um so there are there are some instances there and obviously will not want to stop um because of how to what extent the minister is responding or otherwise but yeah i think i think you're I think members and and the uh, mental health champions con contribution today suggests that um, whilst a lot of responsibility lies with the education minister, there are other departments with responsibility in relation to this. And I think a, a children and young person's well-being recovery strategy program action plan it will, of course, need to be led by um, a minister. But I think you are looking at a, a cross-departmental approach necessary there in order to maximise the benefits of such an, an approach. So. Uh, and, and maybe we could even consider a committee motion calling on the minister to bring forward uh, a more robust wellbeing recovery plan. Um, but that, that's something that we consider. And, and response to Pat there, um, sure, yeah, we we'll will have the, the minister next week where we could raise that as well. Pat, you can want to I come back briefly, and then William, yeah, William indicated as well. So go ahead, Pat, and then I'll bring William in. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I agree with what Daniel's saying. And I mean, I, I made the comment yesterday in the chamber that the minister is a bit like the football manager who has lost the changing room uh, and I suppose the, the results of the lucid talk poll in terms of his popularity uh, bears that out um, he, he's the most unpopular minister uh, in the executive and he definitely doesn't have public confidence so I mean in, in the absence of leadership from the minister I think this committee has to stand up and give a bit of leadership uh, and, and see what influence we can bring to bear on this uh, this massive problem that's coming down the tracks at us. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Uh, William Humphrey wanted to come in there. Thanks, William. Yes, Chair. Um, 
Actually, this is not a problem coming down the tracks. This is the problem that this committee recognised a year ago, Chairman, and you will remember in terms of the, the societal issue that is mental uh, health, general well-being, suicide awareness, and so on. That's why we agreed at that time to do joint stuff with the health committee as well. Uh, so these are, these are issues that are exacerbated and much more acute now, on much higher scale than perhaps they were a year ago. But it's not going to be addressed by sending a letter to the minister. It's not going to be addressed by the Department of Education or the EAA. It needs a holistic, cross-cutting government approach to this with government departments, as you've said, Chair. And that's what that's what Professor O'Neill was saying. There needs to be a holistic, joined-up approach. We should cut the politics out of this. And, 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 and if we're really serious about the young people that we're talking about here, then we need to get all the government ministers, all of the councils, all of the statutory agencies that are involved and the youth youth sports providers and so on to come on board. Otherwise, it is about politics. And I want to see that holistic approach being brought forward. And that's why I put the question and the, the question that needs to be asked, I think, is if money can be provided, that would be great. But who's going to bring them all together to ensure it happens? Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Sir William. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're getting there in terms of suggestions for pathways forward here. I can't cut the politics out of politics myself, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I do think we are we're making some constructive suggestions there, everyone. Um, I feel, feel like checking. I need to bring everybody in here to give their statement. Um, hopefully I don't. But uh, Robbie, did you indicate you want to make a brief comment? No, not at the stage. Uh, so, okay. some there's stuff in there, some stuff I don't say is constructive, but uh, okay. I'll, I'll do my thinking on it, Chair. Thank you. Okay. I think that, the, that as as me all members, to be fair, have acknowledged here, the, the focus is children and young persons' well-being recovery. And as has been mentioned, well-being has been a focus of the committee for quite some time. So um, I, I think that's the, the direction of travel. Um, any, anyone else want to comment before we agree those those actions? Conscious we have a cross-departmental uh, briefing waiting us on a vulnerable children's action plan as well, which is not unrelated. Um, okay, members, so members can tend to agree that those actions, I, I, I think um, an education committee motion um, calling for that type of cross-departmental wellbeing recovery uh, plan may be uh, constructive as well. Maybe work on some draft language on that and bring that back to the, the committee then. Sure. To, to debate the issue in a bit more detail. Is that Robbie? Yeah, just to want to add a wee bit of detail. We had a pr uh, presentation a number of weeks ago with CYSP. I mean, that that's who's uh, doing the cross-departmental uh, work, which is, is is definitely doing a considerable amount on this. And they're very cognizant of the Dublin Down on the, the mental health issues as has been picked up by members today on COVID. So, I mean, there, there already is a piece going. I'm not sure that we're maybe asking for the same answer that we got a couple of weeks ago. We'd be certainly good to get a refresh on that if it's needed uh, for plenary. You referring to the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership, Robbie? That's the one, Chair. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, obviously important work. I'd be surprised if it was as encompassing and as looking at a, a summer program, including partnership between voluntary and community sector and schools. But if it, if it involved physical activity and um, uh, cultural activity as well, if that's the case, um, super. But yeah, definitely something for us to follow up. Okay, members, uh, ha content to agree those actions and uh, move to our next agenda item. Agreed? Okay, thank you. Okay, then, members, uh, agenda item six is the uh, COVID 19 Vulnerable Children Action Plan briefing from Department of Health and Department of Education. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the clerk at page 21, a copy of DE's response to issues raised following our previous DE, DOH briefing on the 18th of November at page 24, a copy of the consultation uh, document on the action plan at page 38, and a briefing paper in tabled papers. Can I welcome our witnesses, uh, which includes Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education, Brenda Shearer, Head of Special Education Team at the Department of Education, Shauna Collinson, Interim Assistant Director of Pupil Inclusion, Wellbeing and Protection at the Education Authority, 
and Eilish McDaniel, Director of Child Care and Family Policy at the Department of Health, and also Morris Leeson, Children's Services Planning Professional at the Health and Social Care Board. Can I advise witnesses that you will have up to 10 minutes to make opening statements, and this will be followed by questions from members. Thank you. Eilish, I'll hand over to you, or Ricky? Okay, Chair, I started. Eilish, thank you. Eilish, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and good morning um, to members. Um, my thanks to the committee again for a further opportunity to provide you with information on the Vulnerable Children and Young People um, Plan, and particularly in relation to the outcome of consultation on the draft. As members are aware, the plan was developed with the support of the Departments of Health, Education, Justice, Communities and the Economy. By way of a quick reminder, I recap on what triggered the development of the plan in the first place and what as a group of departments we set out to achieve. As I explained on the 18th of November, at the start of the pandemic, the Department of Health initiated the weekly collection of data relating to children who come to the attention of children's social services. It became apparent very quickly at the start of the pandemic that the number of referrals to children's social services had fallen considerably below pre-pandemic levels. And in discussions with officials in other jurisdictions, we knew that the same pattern was emerging across the UK. This raised questions about the potential for harm to some children and young people who were no longer visible as a result of lockdown and was one of the reasons and one of the key reasons why we sought to get vulnerable children into schools in the earliest days. However, the trend reversed rapidly. By the 11th of May, the average number of referrals to children's social services was consistently in excess of pre-pandemic levels. And this is a trend which um, was repeated during the circuit breaker, a fall in numbers followed by a spike and it's now being repeated during the current um, period of lockdown, uh, making access to school as important as it was back in March and April last year. The stated aim of the plan is to prom promote the safety and well-being of children and young people during the COVID-19 pandemic in the home environment and in the wider community. It also aims to strengthen the capability of children's services, not only to respond to current challenges and risks, but also to make preparations for the future rebuilding of services alongside responding to further pandemic surges and associated restrictions as necessary. The plan recognises that there are risks facing children and young people in and outside of the home. It also recognises the pressures on children's services caused by the absence of staff personally impacted by the virus and the need to deliver services in keeping with public health advice. On the definition of vulnerable child, and we cast the net widely, it's intended to include children and young people who are receiving support, sorry, who were receiving support before the pandemic, as well as those who were experiencing increased pressure as a direct result of the, of the pandemic. It includes children known to children's social services, including children on the child protection register, children in care, children on the edge of care, care leavers, and children placed for adoption. It extends to children in receipt of child and adolescent mental health services, those who have a statement of special educational needs, and those who are accessing um, education other than at school um, and in education nurture units. It also includes children who are not known um, to staff to do voluntary community support services, but are vulnerable because the family is under increased pressure as a direct result of the pandemic. Asylum seeking and refugee children and young people whose parents have no recourse to public funds are also captured by the definition. The plan reflects how services have adapted and enhanced provision to continue to support children and families during COVID-19, as well as new actions that have been undertaken specifically to address some of the risks and the challenges. The plan was approved by the executive and issued on the 18th of September for an eight-week consultation. We received 50 responses from a wide range of organisations, including voluntary and community and faith organisations, statutory organisations, as well as from local government, professional bodies, political parties and from one of our universities. Those responses have been analysed by the Department of Health on behalf of other departments. Many respondents welcomed the plan and the actions in the plan. The majority of those who responded um, to the questionnaire agreed with the definition of vulnerable children and young people, the objectives of the plan and the actions um, in the plan. Respondents identified areas um, where they felt more could be done and around 50% of those who responded had concerns um, that there are needs not being addressed. And these included concerns about provision for children with complex needs, including a disability, 
autism and special educational needs. A number referenced to how the loss of routines and support had led to an increase in challenging behaviour. The responses also reflected concerns that some children um, would be disadvantaged educationally in homes where parents are not equipped to support home learning, for example, those with lower literacy or numeracy levels, parents who don't speak English, or because of limited access to a digital device or adequate internet provision. Financial, financial hardship and concerns around the number of families in poverty are being pushed into poverty by the pandemic for the first time were also highlighted. Respondents also referenced um, the isolation being experienced by vulnerable children, young people and their families. There were comments as well in relation to harm as a, a, a result of increased time online, um, concerns about gaming addictions, the impact of increased online time on children and young people's mental health, as well as the risks of sexual exploitation. The consultation responses and an analysis of the findings have been shared with other departments so that they can apply the learning to ongoing planning and delivering for vulnerable children and young people um, during um, this current period of um, lockdown and indeed in the future. Under the plan, um, joint working by departments has been facilitated, in particular between the Departments of Health and Education. The feedback from the consultation and evidence provided to the Education Committee has informed the development of the Vulnerable Children and, uh, vulnerable children and Contingency Framework. Um, which has been put in place to ensure that effective education and associated health and social care supports are in place for vulnerable children and young people in circumstances where COVID related restrictions impact on access to schools. The framework is the direct response to calls for a single COVID-19 multidisciplinary vulnerable children process. And I'm going to hand over to Ricky um, at this point to provide more detail on the contingency framework. And then we will um, deal with any questions that members um, might have about the work. Um, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Alish. Ricky, thanks. Thank you, Alish, and thank you, Committee, for the opportunity to update you on progress in this area since our last briefing on the 18th of November. The Contingency Framework for Vulnerable Children and Young People was published on the 31st of December and developed collaboratively with the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, and the Education Authority. And it was based on feedback received from the consultation on the vulnerable children and young people's plan, lessons learned from the initial lockdown and feedback provided from this committee. Amongst other things, that feedback highlighted the need for a single point of referral for parents and carers and health professionals and the impact that the closure of special schools and the lack of access to essential health, essential health therapies and supports had on the quality of life for children and their families. The department recognises that special schools provide an essential service for children who have multiple complex needs and disabilities, and this has been the focus of much of our work in recent weeks. Whilst remote learning is stressful and challenging for all families, it is particularly so for some vulnerable children and their families. Over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, the executive has rightly sought to prioritise the education of our children and young people. At the end of December, the executive decided to move to remote learning for all mainstream education providers, including preschool education settings and primary and post-primary schools. Schools are open for supervised learning for key worker and vulnerable children, and special schools have remained open since the beginning of term. This step was taken in light of public health advice, which requires us all to contribute to reduce the volume of community contacts to bring the virus under control. While special schools are open, attendance of pupils is encouraged, but not mandatory. Many special schools operate with a reduced pupil to teacher ratio, which reflects the level and nature of support required to meet the specific needs of these children. Indeed, approximately 50% of parents whose children attend special schools have chosen to keep their children at home due to concerns about the impact of the virus and the rapidly changing environment. This has further reduced the number of children in special schools during these challenging times. The executive decision to keep special schools open was informed by the experiences of many families who earlier in the pandemic suffered when access to schools was restricted. For some of our most vulnerable children, the protective factor of routine attendance at school, along with continued access to health and other supports, provides a vital essential service which helps protect their health and well-being and provides support for families at a time of increased public health restrictions. However, the decision to keep our special schools open does not mean that their staff are in any way less valued than staff in mainstream schools who in the main 
are currently supporting remote learning. The department recognises the fear and anxiety of staff in special schools and the scale of challenges they currently face. In terms of the assessment of risk, there is no evidence that teachers or educational staff are at increased risk of infection or any significant health related issue due to COVID when compared with the general population. The Minister wrote to special school principals recently to express his gratitude for the continued hard work, dedication and determination to support our children in the face of increasing adversity. Throughout the pandemic, the Department of Education, the Department of Health, the EA, the PHA and Health and Social Care staff have continued to work with the Special Schools Strategic Leadership Group to ensure they are supported during the pandemic. A range of additional actions have been taken since the start of January, which include more frequent engagement with the Strategic Leadership Group, including representation from the Public Health Agency. A webinar, a webinar for special schools principals, which included a presentation from the PHA in relation to transmission rates. The EA has reviewed home to school transport arrangements to reduce the mixing of schools, schools and bubbles. The EA has provided support to schools in relation to risk assessments. The EA has assigned dedicated support officers to special schools. An emergency staffing response has been put in place to support schools with staff shortages. Updated guidance has issued from both the department and the EA, included in including in relation to remote learning, and the reactivation of the regular vulnerable children reporting by the EA in relation to its pupil support services. Of particular significance are the issues of vaccination and testing within our special schools. The minister presented a paper to the executive, which ar argued strongly for the vaccination of school staff with priority given to those teachers and staff supporting special schools as the vaccination program rolls out. Following uh, executive consideration, further engagement between departments occurred and ministers have now agreed that staff in special schools who are supporting children with the most complex healthcare needs mm -hmm. will be offered the vaccine. It is recognised that some special school staff uh, are caring for children, uh, children required to be cared uh, carry out intimate procedures sorry, on children due to their complex needs. While we know that children are not at increased risk, these are some of the most vulnerable young people in our society and by vaccinating the special school staff, we are protecting those children who may be at higher risk if exposed to COVID-19. Both departments have also agreed and announced a PHA proposal to commence weekly asymptomatic testing for special school staff and pupils. Testing will commence this month and will contribute to reducing the rate of infections in special schools as regular testing will identify cases either before they are symptomatic or asymptomatic cases, allowing immediate self-isolation and thereby reducing potential for wider transmission both within the school and in the contact groups of pupils and staff. Chair, in conclusion, the, voluntary, the, sorry, the vulnerable children planning process enabled us to identify and articulate the risks and challenges experienced by children and families during the pandemic to identify what departments were doing in response to those risks and challenges and to identify the gaps in provision and to promote new responses. The pandemic has prompted, in some cases out of necessity, mm -hmm. services to be delivered in innovative and new ways. It is important that we capture the lessons learned, both good and bad, from this experience and recognise and react to the scale of the challenge for some children, young people and their families. The plan is an emergency plan developed in response to a public health emergency. It was not intended to be, nor is it a substitute for longer term planning under existing strategies, including the children and young people strategy and associated strategies for vulnerable groups of children and young people and their families, such as the children looked after strategy. Members should note that the children and young people strategy has now identified the impact of the pandemic as one of the areas of greatest focus going forward. It had already identified many of the children who fall within the definition of vulnerable children under the plan as children whose needs require specific attention. For many of those children, their needs have been exacerbated by the pandemic, meaning that departments will need to work together in the future, potentially redoubling their efforts to ensure that those needs are met. The key priority areas identified by the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership, which it will take forward over the next planning period, likewise align with key areas of concern coming through the vulnerable children planning process and from local and wider research on the impact of the pandemic. So they are children's mental health and emotional well-being, 
early intervention support for children with disabilities and their families, support to children whose well-being is being affected by disruption to their schooling, and contribution to strategic cross-departmental actions in response to food and fuel poverty, as well as locality-based service responses. Members of the partnership, which include all the key children's organisations across a range of sectors, will prioritise these four issues as a shared concern. They have committed to seek opportunities to work together and to coordinate activity to address these concerns. They will also share practice, best practice and shared learning. Um, and Chair, just to finish, I'd like to apologise for the lateness of the papers that were provided to the committee um, yesterday. Um, that was my responsibility. In future, we'll endeavour to provide those papers in a more timely fashion. Um, so happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks for that. Thanks for the presentations. Um, obviously essential to have a vulnerable children's action plan in place. Um, good to see the departments cooperating together in relation to it. But um, it would be remiss of me not to ask for my first question why it has taken a year of a pandemic to get the Vulnerable Children Action Plan in place, Ricky. Chair, I think uh, the plan has actually been out for consultation, I think, uh, since the latter half of last year. So, and the actions within the plan have been ongoing since the pandemic uh, started. So what has happened with the consultation is it has helped us to refine those actions going forward, including the development of the contingency framework, which was issued uh, at the beginning of the year. Okay. Do you accept this is coming too late? Um, for many children and young people who have complex needs and been um, experiencing harm throughout the pandemic? I think, Chair, what I would say is, and others can come in behind me, we certainly have learned a lot of lessons over the course of the last few months in terms of how we can improve our communication, in terms of how we can provide clarity on the support that is available and how it can be accessed and also in terms of seeking input from stakeholders to that planning process. Um, what we have clearly done over the course of the last few months is enhance the level of multidisciplinary and multi-agency working and cross-departmental working. Um, that has continued to improve, uh, and what we are seeing now is a much more coordinated um, response. I don't know, Eilish, if there's anything you want to say from health perspective on that? I, I agree with Ricky. I mean, I think it is wrong to suggest that um, we're only putting the plan in place um, now. I mean, the plan has been in place um, throughout the pandemic. Um, we took the opportunity to consult on the plan to make absolutely certain that um, what we were doing um, was the right thing to do. And, you know, were there other things where our attention um, needed um, to be focused um, on? That was the purpose of, of, of the consultation. And, and we will take the learning from that consultation and, uh, and the, I think not only applied to what we're doing under this plan, but I, I would propose to ensure that it is applied um, to um, the implementation of the wider children's strategy um, in the longer um, term. And, and Ricky has reflected that in, in his opening remarks. Okay. And can you provide us with an update with regards to the establishment of a Vulnerable Children Action Plan reference group that would include educators, health staff, parents, children and young people um, to ensure that that inclusive approach to the implementation of the plan remains in place? Uh, sure, I can give an answer to that question. Uh, we've um, been working to establish the reference group and have used the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership locality planning groups to identify parents who would be interested in taking part in this. We have a facilitator in place and um, uh, we are planning to have the first meeting of that group uh, this week. We've also established a Children and Young People's group. Children and Young People's group is a little bit ahead of, of the parents group and it's been reporting for the last two weeks on a weekly basis into our joint health and education uh, forum to reflect the views of, of children and young people and it's the intention then of parents reference group will do exactly the same 
Okay, it'd be great to get uh, some of that detail in writing, if possible, in terms of progress that's been made in that regard. Okay, then, uh, can I also ask when special school staff will receive the vaccination as announced recently? Uh, Chair, yes. So, we, following the executive's um, decision and the announcement that was uh, made a couple of days ago, um, we have been working with the strategic leadership group uh, of special schools to identify staff um, who would be um, eligible. We have a meeting with special, special school principals this afternoon, uh, and then I have a meeting tomorrow with the Deputy um, Chief Medical Officer, the PHA and the Education Authority to uh, determine how this programme will be ruled out. We, of course, want to be able to rule this out as quickly as possible, uh, and that is the intention of, of all parties concerned. Okay. Um, I, I think this is a positive development, so I, I don't want to make it any more challenging for you than it is, Ricky, but the, the, the criteria set out um, included um, special school staff providing personal and intimate care one, one would imagine that that includes almost all special school staff, no? Um, Chair, of course, um, the Department of Health um, are very keen that the criteria that they have set um, respects the principles of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, JCVI. So um, what has been agreed is that staff should be offered the vaccination if they are supporting those children and young people who have the most complex healthcare needs, which require the coordination and provision of support from education, health, and or social care services within the school's setting. So we have a fairly <clears throat> long list, which is not exhaustive, of clinical interventions, which would fall um, under that description. Um, we are currently working with um, the strategic leadership group to identify the staff that that would apply to. Um, my hope is that that would apply to um, a large proportion of those staff, but we haven't um, fully bottomed that detail out yet. Okay. Would it be more efficient to vaccinate all staff? Um, I can't comment on the vaccination rollout program, Chair. Okay. That's, a, that's a matter for health. Okay, I think I think other members will maybe come in on, on that as well. Final question from me, uh, Ricky, is has has the department assessed the impact of non school based learning on pupils at this stage? Chair, I understand that the uh, Education and Training Inspector at ETI have commenced uh, a survey uh, of um, remote learning. So um, I understand there are um, there are actions underway to evaluate um, the quality uh, of remote learning and provision. Okay, um, I think we'd expect um, a more advanced response uh, than that at this stage. But the final, final question then, Ricky, I don't know whether you heard the uh, mental health champions evidence today or not, but clear calls for a, a children and young person's well-being recovery strategy and action plan. Can, can you update the committee as to whether the Department of Education has uh, scoped or is scoping uh, a wellbeing recovery strategy and action plan to include the like of a summer program? Chair, as you know, we were uh, at this committee on the 11th of November in relation to the department's emotional health and wellbeing framework. Um, which we're calling the wellbeing framework. And that's now at an advanced stage with a number of the individual projects within it uh, up and running. Um, I believe I did catch Siobhan O'Neill um, mention that she was impressed with the framework and we've welcomed her um, support on that uh, and we'll continue to engage with her as, as we move forward. In terms, and now that, that framework, as you know, was developed in advance of the pandemic so it was not designed specifically as a response to the pandemic. However, it will play a key part. Um, during the restart program, there was a well-being work stream that was established um, within the Education Authority, which has focused on supporting schools and pupils in terms of well-being um, support over the course of the last few months. 
I anticipate that that well-being work stream will continue. We met yesterday. Um, we are beginning our planning um, in terms of uh, further restart, and we will engage more widely across the department and the education sector on the relevant actions that need to be brought forward. There was a well-being restart fund in terms of monies that were provided directly to schools um, to support um, pupils uh, and deliver activities within those schools. Some, uh, some of those monies are still available to schools, and I anticipate that those um, those activities will continue to be rolled out over the course of the next few weeks up to the end of this financial year. Yeah, mental health champion definitely did um, positively reference the wellbeing framework. However, concerns were raised about the adequacy of the funding allocated to that and perhaps the uh, lack of any future bids. Uh, can, can you say anything more about the adequacy of, of funding available or and or bid for to implement a full pandemic focused wellbeing framework? So we have secured five million pounds per annum in terms of the education budget and the Department of Health have committed a further 1.5 million per annum from the 21-22 year onwards. I think we talked about this uh, at the committee on the 11th of November. Um, we have a broad range of actions which have been developed between health and education um, right across um, the spectrum in terms of pupils, parents, schools and teachers. I think as we move forward with those individual uh, interventions, we'll want to keep that under review. And if, um, if need is identified, I have no hesitation in saying that uh, I will bid for additional funds if that's required. Okay, uh, maybe a, an update on the wellbeing uh, framework in particular would be timely in due course then, Ricky, I realise we're focusing on the, the Vulnerable Children Action Plan today. Thank you. Sure. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA? Thanks. Well, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to all of you for your contribution this morning. Uh, a, a question has just occurred to me, uh, and it's for the team in Rath Gale there. Uh, is there any particular reason why the four of you can't be working from home? Um, thank you for the question, Pat. Um, what Personally, what I have found is that when it comes to engaging with um, the committee, um, it's easier for us to be uh, in work for that. But I can assure you that the remainder of the time um, I am working from home. Yeah. Connectivity is a problem sometimes with the Zoom calls that you drop in and out of signals. Signals are bad at home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it can be quite bad uh, in terms of the assembly broadcasting as well. So uh, I, I don't think they're unique. If there are reasons to go into the office, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Uh, I'm, it's just curiosity as much as anything. Yeah. But in any event, going on to uh, my other questions, and I want to pick up on uh, the issue that Chris, Chris raised with you there at the end of his contribution uh, in, in terms of what funding there would be to advance emotional health and, and well-being. And you referenced, Ricky, that there was $5 million extra from the education budget and another $1.5 million from health. And, I mean, under normal circumstances, that might be adequate, although I would argue it wouldn't be even in normal circumstances, but we're in very abnormal circumstances. Uh, we're talking about uh, six and a half million to be divided between uh, a, a thousand schools, uh, over 350,000 pupils and staff as well. Let's not forget about them also. So once that's all divided out, it's going to be pretty thin on the ground. And uh, I'm just wondering what extra bids have been made for funding to take account of the uh, the emergency situation we're in at the minute. And uh, the and and Javon O'Neill didn't disagree with me when I used the term tsunami to describe what's going to be facing us when the, the schools eventually reopen again. Thanks. It's a, it's a good question, Pat, and what I would say is, on top of the monies that I mentioned previously, there was a further $5 million, um, that was secured this year and distributed directly to schools. Um, for next year, uh, we're looking at 
bids in terms of restart and part of that restart bid would be an element for well-being so i made reference to a group which the ea chairs for well-being we met yesterday we talked about this it is our intention to put together a bid um again for uh I would have thought at least another five million, but potentially a lot more, depending on the types of projects that we identify uh, are required. So th that would be uh, in addition to the six and a half million that would be there from next year if we're successful in those bids. Okay, thanks for that. Um, um, it's, it's not very clear, to be honest, Ricky. Uh, and I'm wondering. Is there a, an acknowledgement of the enormity of the problems that are facing us? Uh, so, I mean, there are a number of issues we need to deal with. One, is there a proper integrated strategy between health and education in, particularly, in particular, but, uh, I mean, which may also involve other departments? Uh, and is there going to be adequate funding uh, to uh, support an integrated strategy, which is going to deal with all the lost learning uh, and all the emotional and psychological uh, problems that children are going to have as a result of the difficulties and challenges that have been faced during the pandemic? There's definitely a level of, of work going on within the department right now in terms of scoping all of that out. Uh, certainly in terms of um, levels of lost learning. And as I mentioned, we are working with health and the EA in terms of the well-being aspect um, of that. We do have an integrated well-being framework, which was developed between ourselves and health agencies, which we are about to launch, which I, which I referenced earlier, which has a significant number of interventions, some of which have already started. I know as well that the Department of Health is working on a mental health strategy with a range of work streams within it, including for children and young people. Um, I don't have the detail of that with me today, but, uh, unless um, Eilish is able to speak a wee bit about that, but there's a significant amount of work being taken forward uh, at that level as well. And I and the Department of Education are heavily involved in that broader mental health strategy for the entire population. And in terms of the lost learning, um, there is the Mainstream Engage programme, and it is funding of around 11 million, and will run to the end of this academic year in June. And um, we are awaiting um, business case approval for the Engage programme for special schools as well, which will be around 850k up until the end of June. So there are um, plans in place to get that rolled out as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Elish. Elish, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, yes, Pat. Just, just to say that you I mean there have been further investments um, made in mental health services um, as part of the implementation of the health action plan that was um, published last year um, by the minister, and that that included um, a mental health um, response um, plan as part of that. So there's one and a half million. Um, put into implementing the mental health action plan, and that included some funding for a, a managed care network for um, children and young people. I mean, Ricky has said that we're currently um, consulting on a mental health um, strategy that started before Christmas, and members are probably aware of that, and it will run um, through to March of this year. I, I just want to assure members that there is provision within that strategy um, or proposals within that strategy specifically for um, children and young people. Just to mention um, a few of those, um, the proposal is to promote positive social and emotional development and throughout childhood, um, mm -hmm. provide enhanced and accessible mental health services um, for those who need specialist um, support, increased funding for um, children and adolescent, adolescent mental health um, services, and I think we currently invest around 21 million in those services um, at the minute. Um, and uh, finally then to create um, uh, consistent, uh, urgent emergency and crisis re um, um, responses um, to children and young people. And um, the strategy is out for consultation at the minute. Okay, okay, thanks for that. And I mean, some, some of that, Eilish, I'm sure you'll agree, is, is funding that was already in place or was going to be in place. And I'm, I'm talking about 
the crisis that's going to face us as a result of the outworkings of this pandemic and the challenge it, challenges that it has thrown up. And I, I don't want to in any way denigrate the, the, the work you're doing, but, I mean, it's, it's our responsibility to scrutinise and, and hold the account, uh, and we would be remiss in our responsibilities if we didn't do that. Now, one of the failures, as I see it, was that uh, there was no contingency plan in place for vulnerable children during the October uh, lockdown, during the circuit breaker. Uh, and given the stark realities that these children and their, their parents faced, uh, there was more than enough time, particularly during the summer, to get some sort of contingency plan in place in case we faced another crisis, and it didn't happen. Can you give me an explanation as to why that didn't happen? Thanks. The executive, um, ahead, the executive had announced that the Halloween break was an actual holiday, so that meant that all services uh, went under the holiday footing. Can I just come in um, from an education authority perspective in terms of the, the services delivered to vulnerable young people? They, they, you know, were were activated from the the twenty fourth of March, and the services had to had to pivot and change delivery mm -hmm. models with regards to the, the restrictions that were in place at the time and the learnings then that took place with you know online technologies and, and interacting with families and young people since that time. Um, during circuit breakers, during summer holidays, of, of course, different services have been on holiday at different times, but the services have continued to deliver and connect to young people. And we've continued to make sure that there have been resources and platforms for young people to engage with. Um, so that they they are equipped with with the tools that they need to be for their own well-being um, and they know where to go if they need additional support for their safety and well-being. There's still um, work to be done as, as we move into the next stages, but just to reassure that service delivery has been available um, even when schools have been on, on breaks at, at different points. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Pat. Pat, apologies. You got extra time there because my uh, my connection dropped out. <laughs> All right. Uh, can I bring in uh, Rob? Robin William is indicating that he he may have to move on. Are Are you willing to switch places with him, or will we go ahead with Robin Newton there? William comes in now. Okay. Thanks, Robin. William Humphrey. Leader. Um, I, I, I just wanted to um, thank you very much, all of you, for coming along this morning. I don't have a question, such chair, but I just wanted to um, reiterate the point uh, of colleagues in relation to the the presentation we've just had and the the uh, issue, uh, huge issue we're going to face at the far end of this pandemic, which was an issue we faced beforehand. Except it will be much more acute and much more sizable. And I do encourage the department to work with other government departments with local councils uh, and other youth providers um, you know statutory uh, voluntary sports and uniformed in terms of getting a solution and i suppose the key thing that i wanted to say was it is important that in terms of the children and young persons well-being action plan that we need to have someone to convene that and i just simply wanted to make that point chair thank you and thanks Roman. thanks that william uh, William, that was uh, graciously brief enough that we'll maybe just go to Robin now as well, to be fair. Robin, Newton? And, uh, can I uh, thank all those uh, present? Uh, like others, uh, I've actually lost connection, I think, four, maybe five times this morning. And the sound quality, particularly when Eilish was speaking, uh, was, was very poor. So... Um, uh, can I maybe just and if if, I, if something has been covered, uh, Chair, please forgive me uh, for that. Okay. I just want to say that um, this is a, an action plan for vulnerable children, and uh, I welcome and I welcome the, the 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 comprehensive joined up thinking between health and education. That that is uh, excellent. I think I, I, I take you back. Uh, some time, Ricky, to um, when we as a committee met with the school uh, principals leadership uh, group, uh, and they were reporting to us that they felt uh, isolated, 
uh, not listened to, that there was a lack of communication, uh, and they felt undervalued, and indeed that they had been set aside uh, from the mainstream. Uh, and in that being set aside, that they felt that uh, they weren't getting the attention that, that they deserve. Can I ask you in this plan, have you benchmarked uh, what we're intending to do in terms of how it compares with uh, England, Scotland, Wales? And, and indeed, uh, in trying to also look forward to the future, perhaps just outline the steps that we will see emerging over the next few months? Sure, Robin. Okay. Um, in terms of our engagement with the strategic leadership group of special school principals, um, <clears throat> I'm in touch with them on an extremely regular basis. We have now scheduled regular meetings with the entire group um, since Christmas. And indeed, in the months uh, running up to Christmas, we were already engaging with that group uh, across a range of issues within the special schools, as have the Education um, Authority. So they have been heavily involved um, in shaping and informing our response over the course of, of the last um, wee while. As part of our development of the contingency framework, we did look um, broadly across the four nations and beyond in terms of um, what lessons are there out there and what can we um, bring in to our planning and our thinking. And we have done that through our joint health and education oversight group, which meets on a weekly basis, which effectively led the development of the contingency framework. So there has been um, a, a benchmarking and a looking across uh, at other um, actions. And I suppose in terms of the future, it is our intention to keep our engagement with the special schools um, going forward on a regular basis. It's also our intention to keep our interfaces between the two departments and the respective um, authorities in place on a regular basis. Uh, and in fact, we, we have um, developed that during the course of the last um, few months to the point where um, we now have uh, input coming in as Morris outlined in terms of the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership and the two reference groups for children and for parents. So. We will continue to build on those uh, processes uh, and, and, and if there are things that we need to be responding to and planning for, that is how we will do it. Okay, so I could just ask you, in terms of um, how favourably do you feel that we are uh, benchmarked against other areas? <clears throat> I think the circumstances are, are different. Uh, I mean, certainly the decision here by the executive to keep special schools open that was taken at the at the beginning of the new year would, would have been uh, different to other jurisdictions but one of course which we welcomed uh, and as soon as that decision um, was made we moved very quickly to make sure that there was appropriate support in place for those um, special schools. I think other jurisdictions uh, are now looking at their special school population and identifying them as a particular cohort um, that they would like um, to make sure that there's appropriate support in place for. So we will continue to do that benchmarking um, on, on a regular basis. And, and looking beyond what my responsibility is within the department, I know the broader restart team within the department has been doing a lot of scanning right across the world in terms of the pandemic response and the education response within that. So we are constantly being um, given reports uh, and various lessons learned and uh, pieces of best practice and good practice that are being identified from other jurisdictions almost on a global basis, I would say. Yeah, and as you, as you absorb those into, uh, Ricky, will we be gold medal, silver medal or bronze medal? Um, or, Robin, I, I, would, I wouldn't like to self-award uh, on that on that basis uh, for fear speak of being biased. On, speak on behalf of the team and, and health as well. Then, um, look, there are always things that we can do better. I think we've been very frank with you on that. Um, you know, we there are things we have learned a number of lessons. We will continue to learn, um, and we will continue to try and support our most vulnerable children as best we can. Um, don't ask me to give marks out of ten. 
<laughs> okay. No, no, uh, no algorithms involved, Ricky. Okay. Uh, thanks, Definitely Robin. Not. Thanks, okay. Robin. Um, can I bring uh, Daniel McCrossin in, please? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for your presentations and for answering uh, questions so far. A few of my questions have been taken up, but I just want to follow on on a few things. There was discussion uh, with the Engage pro about the Engage program. I think it was Patchy Hinn brought it up. Uh, but I'm just wondering about an Engage program for nursery places. Is there one? Uh, good question, um, Daniel. I, I'm, I don't know. I need to take that away and come back to you. There's, there's not. There's yeah. not. Right. Well, there you go. Yeah, Rick, Ricky, just be bluntly honest. That there, there's I, I not. Don't know. I, um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's a bit worrying because early intervention, we've been told all along, is key. So I'm just wondering why the department very clearly are neglecting early intervention. Um. Well. Daniel, it's unfortunately it's straying beyond my my remit within the department, so I, I can't I can't answer in terms of nursery schools and engage and and that that aspect. But I would be happy to come back to you with a more detailed response, uh, and I'll engage with colleagues after this committee session. Yeah, but you know I know it's not at your feet entirely, but uh, you know there's there's vulnerable children at nursery schools as well, and this isn't something that I'm bringing up for the first time today. This is raised continually, uh, and has been raised with uh, quite a number of MLA. So I don't know why we're sitting nearly a year into this pandemic where quite where all of our children have been affected to some degree, some more significantly than others. Why we're in a situation now where you. Uh, the department hasn't done anything about this where there's no engage money for them there's the engage program that's being rolled out for the special schools a, lot, a, a number of our special schools run from the three to 19 cohort mm. so they will be covered within the engage money going out for special schools but as ricky says the wider engage program we wouldn't be over the detail and we'll provide an answer in writing to the committee okay, chair someone's got their Thing on, on, on mute, and I can hear them typing. So yeah, if sorry, Daniel. Yeah, if everybody could uh, ensure they're muted when they're not speaking, that uh, aids the audio for the uh, questioner and respondent. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, j just in relation to uh, what is what, what has been said, um, uh, it is worrying that there, there hasn't been money allocated uh, for these children. I don't think it's entirely acceptable. We, we're here today hearing a presentation about what, what has been done to the department, and I think you're leaving out a key aspect of that. But you answered there's nothing in place as of yet, but I do think there needs to be something. Uh, in terms of following up on another point, uh, vaccination, uh, this is brought up by other members as well. Some special uh, school staff are to be vaccinated and others won't be. Um, uh, from my understanding or interpretation of what has been said so far, how does the department intend to identify who should be vaccinated and who should not be vaccinated? How do you take into account the way many of these very vulnerable children interact with many special school staff on a daily basis? This will be complicated. Daniel, the criteria for the vaccination programme for special schools has been determined by the Department of Health. Um, so we will work very closely with them in the implementation of that. And of course, um, we need to work with the special schools themselves in terms of identifying the relevant staff. So that is the point that we are at now. It will be the schools that will determine who is eligible within that criteria. So it will be for schools to determine who will be eligible? That is correct. That's a very awkward position to be put a principal into. Well, I've been engaging with the special school strategic leadership group uh, and um, uh, there are no indications that that's going to be a particular problem at this time. But as I said, we have a meeting this afternoon with the group. I have a further meeting tomorrow with the Department of Health on rollout, uh, and I'll be engaging very closely with the special schools on how this is taken forward. I'd be very surprised uh, that there's not concerns in relation to this. That is putting a huge amount of pressure on school leaders uh, to handpick who within their school uh, should or should not receive this vaccine. Uh, I don't think that's a very fair uh, position to place school principals under, and it is adding further stress and pressure as is. It also is asking, I suppose, 
uh, various people within the school to plead their case for the vulnerability of their individual children. Uh, and there will be a diverse range uh, across the special schools sector as to what complex individual needs children have. This won't be easy. Uh, and I don't think that I don't think it's going to be straightforward, and I think it's it's very, very difficult for school leaders to be put in this position. We have um, had discussions with CMO, and we have a list, whilst it's not exhaustive, of um, procedures that are similar to health and social care duties undertaken by staff, um, and the, the principals will be making uh, assessments in relation to those that list in discussions with PHA and, and ourselves in the Department of Health. Yeah, I think it's it's fair to say that the schools will not be alone in this, Daniel. Um, the Education Authority will be assisting. The Public Health Agency will also be assisting. We have a long list of clinical interventions, but it is by no means an exhaustive list. We know that the schools, first and foremost, are best placed to identify um, the, the the children. Um, who would require these interventions because they are dealing with them on a daily basis. Um, however, PHA staff and nursing staff and therapy staff also know those children. So this will be a um, cross-agency approach. Uh, the, uh, yes, uh, and, and I appreciate that entirely, but I, I, I just have concerns, which will be flagged again in relation to how this is going to be handled. Uh, I've already mentioned numbers with our previous guest, the uh, uh, health champion, uh, Professor Siobhan O'Neill, and outlined that there's about four and a half thousand uh, special school staff across the 40 special school schools uh, 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 in Northern Ireland. It's not a huge number. It could be dealt with very quickly. I just think you're, adding, you're going to add a, a, an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy and complication to an already very, very uh, important issue and one that's been taken very seriously by a lot of us. I, I, I think that there needs to be more done on this and more thought before uh, it's properly actioned because I know that whilst it was a positive re a, a positive announcement that special school staff will be vaccinated, there was a huge backlash, which each of us in this committee have heard of uh, from many people who, who who will not be vaccinated within special schools. So there's there's an issue here. Uh, just to jump on to a few questions, uh, Chair, briefly. Yeah, during final, the, final question, Daniel. Thank you. During Thanks. the first lockdown, serious issues arose for vulnerable children when vital support services were no longer available to special schools, nor the children uh, or their parents. What lessons have uh, the department learned around this, and how do you intend to ensure that such mistakes do not reoccur? Um, Daniel, I think there are a number of, there are probably lessons right across all the organisations who've been involved in this response. I can speak from uh, the Department of Education's perspective, and others may want to come in um, behind me. Certainly, one of the things that we've considered would be around having more clear and better communication. Um, we also want to be, be very clear about the level of support which has been provided and how to access that uh, support. Uh, and we also want to make sure that we seek. Um, regular uh, input from key stakeholders, for example, the Children's Law Centre, the uh, Children's Commissioner, in terms of our uh, planning processes. And when we put together the contingency framework, we did do all of those things. We also looked at enhancing our multidisciplinary and agency working. Uh, and I suppose from the department's perspective, they would be the main, the main lessons learned, but others may want to add to that. Mars, well, Dan, yeah. I would say from a health point of view that uh, I mean, uh, uh, Ricky's quite right. The lessons have been learned, and uh, we continue to to provide services. Uh, uh, we meet on a regular basis um, uh, to ensure that there, if there are issues arising, that those can be addressed. But, but I can assure you that those services continue. Okay. Okay, Chair. Very brief point. Final. Uh, there's a strong uh, perception of disparity Daniel. provision within the special school sector. Um, Daniel, I, I they just believe that. To come in briefly there, and then I'll let you make your, your okay. final point. Okay. okay. Eilish, yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I mean, we did make decisions in the first lockdown that we absolutely didn't make um, in this um, third wave. You know, so using respite to, as, a, as an example of services that were closed mm -hmm. down the um, mm -hmm. first time around, um, you know, decisions were made. Um, not to do that um, from July of this year. And I'm not saying that those services are fully operational at, at the minute because there are challenges um, to do that safely. But there, definitely there were decisions made first time around that we 
have not um, repeated this one third um, wave. Okay. okay. Thanks, Final comment, Daniel. Yep. Thanks. Just to, to continue, there's a strong perception of disparity in provision within the special school sector. Uh, many believe uh, that relative to the mainstream sector, the professionalism and skill set are not respected. They are not even trusted to operate their own budgets. What other resource or capacity do you intend to ex uh, extend to special schools to address this clear disparity? Ricky, do you want to make a very brief comment on that uh, or anyone else? And then I'm, I'll bring Robbie Butler, MLA, in. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. Uh, look, I suppose that, uh, I mentioned our engagement with the Strategic Leadership Group, um, you know, during the course of the last year. Uh, you know, they are the issues that have been raised. The, the group have also met with the Minister and raised those similar issues. So we have given a commitment that we will um, continue to engage with them and, and, and work through those issues as best we can. Um, there are... There are Probably a broad range of issues that special schools have have raised in terms of you know some of the funding arrangements and so on. Um, but uh, along with the EA, I can assure you that we will be uh, working uh, with them to try and resolve those. Thank you, thank you, all. thanks, Chair. Thanks, Daniel. Robbie Butler, MLA. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, thank you, everyone, so far for for, for your input. I'm gonna. Uh, perhaps sort of uh, change the conversation a little bit because there's a, there's quite a few other uh, demographics and sectors within the um, the vulnerable children that we haven't touched on and who will have been impacted uh, every bit as much and perhaps even more with regard to COVID. So, um, and I say this with with due respect to the family that were impacted by this last night in North Belfast, but we still still have a scourge of uh, of uh, paramilitarism uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, my, my sympathy goes to the family uh, in North Belfast. And yesterday in East Belfast, we had a, a group of individuals uh, on the street, uh, and it did look quite sinister. Uh, we have 284 uh, individuals engaged in the START program at the moment. Um, can you give us an update with regard to the uh, any difficulties or what has been done with regard to supporting those people and identifying other vulnerable young people that that uh, START program might actually help and assist, given the fact that they haven't went away, you know? Okay, Robbie, can I just start there? Yeah, Eilish, Eilish, go ahead, and then we'll bring other witnesses in. Thanks. I don't know whether we're talking about the same the same program um, here, but certainly um, feedback that I've received from the um, Department of Justice um, has indicated that um, there are still programs up and um, running um, designed to actually um, target young people who might be at risk of um, becoming involved in paramilitary activity, organised crime or, or, or criminality, and, and they have continued um, to operate um, throughout the pandemic. Apologies, Rob Robbie, if we're talking about something um, different, and I suspect that they are. Go ahead, John. Yes, I think, Robbie, if I come in, it's the, the Education Authority Youth Service who run our, our START programme. Um, and whilst I don't have the full detail of it, you are right that that um, we actually, there's um, a, a number of young people engaging with that programme and we've got the formal formal links with the SNI and Youth Justice Agencies in order to escalate and provide additional support um, and, and formal links in with the third sector organisations um, and ability to access CAMS for those young people as well. Um, there's been development of online re-engagement with young people um, due to the, the pandemic and the the recent um, restrictions, but we also have where there are young people um, most at risk, we have provision in place where we can meet them on a face-to-face basis and, and provide them with the, the um, that they need and that we have clear communication strategies in place with their, with their parents and carers around the work um, that is being undertaken and, and, and the risks that, that they're currently living with. Um, so I know certainly our, our youth service would um, can provide in writing further update to you on, of any more detail that's needed on that. I would appreciate that because I, I think given, and it's not just COVID at the moment, obviously there is the, the, the issues with protocol and so on. And, and whilst that might seem like big stuff, there's no doubt that our young people and our vulnerable young people have been easy prey uh, for those intent uh, uh, to change and destroy lives. So I think that's something I really would appreciate an update on because I can imagine that the START programme will have been impacted in some way. There will have been some difficulties with regard to I know it's still running because I know that uh, through the Education Authority Youth Services we have had some updates, but um, I think it's it's important that we don't uh, leave those young people behind because I think in the void at the moment they are really really at risk, 
are, are yeah. with serious concerns about um, sort of uh, those that might seem want to groom those vulnerable young people or uh, or they might even come under harm because obviously the program identifies young people that, who are at harm um, yeah. to, to these. The other program yeah, that is also... Is. Just to reassure, it absolutely is still running and, and each young person does have a contact plans in place um, so that they, they have that regular link in with their youth worker. Brilliant. No. Okay. Thank you. The other one is the end of the FLIR program, which again is an education authority uh, youth service. It's it's incredibly good. So, um, I mean, it was obviously going before COVID, but obviously COVID has happened. Is there any update on that? I think there's 149 receiving support. So, in terms, of, is that down or is that is that up? Uh, and how does it work to engage uh, to identify young people that might uh, benefit from being on this program? Um, again, the youth service will be able to provide um, a detailed update for you, and, and I'll take that back to, to the members of our team. Um, but, but absolutely, the, the young people that are engaged continue to be supported, and there's one-to-one -one engagement contact plans um, again in place with those young people and their families, or there's small group um, or face-to-face one-to-one sessions that are ongoing as well, depending on the needs. Um, and the, the ambassadors within the FLIR programme then are, are working um, to provide resources and, and contact and, and make sure that young people know where and how they can access them through online platforms and um, and online online resources as well. Um, there, in terms of the the um, referrals of those young people that, that may come from other EA services that are aware of young people um, whose emotional um, well-being would be benefited by being part of the FLIR program and at the minute we have around seven and a half thousand contacts a week with vulnerable young people and families through other EA services um, that may that may escalate concerns into the FLIR team and, and that team would then pick those young people up. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we're, we're communicating to the young people as well through the youth online platform and um, that they can self-refer into different youth programs to get the support that they need as well and there's been um a, a, an increase in the 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 number of young people accessing that online platform and um, through youth online as well but again i'll come back to you um in writing from our youth service colleagues with some more detail on that brilliant and just a final one then and this is about looked after children um it was looked after children were certainly uh an important part of the um last program for government and i would hope to be picked up uh, as a group that need additional support so there are a number I, th I think it's quite a high number i think it's around 600 and uh, odd young people within the looked after child uh, sector who have been identified as uh, as vulnerable as well um so the, their um issues are sort of compounded to a, 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 the fact that they are in the looked after child services whether that's haven't been fostered or whatever and then have additional um issues and then if you look at the the um the changes in the problems in and around the examinations and the allocation of grades, that's what's in the programme for government. It's, it's trying to target these young people and ensure that their, their outcomes are as good as possible. Um, I would hate to think that we were missing something here, that when we're looking after all of these young people, that there are some young people who genuinely um, who are, are, are uh, already got a, a harder start in life and, and you know, and, and want to make sure that this is all the support including uh, whatever the minister's going to do in terms of examinations and i know it's not today's uh, necessary to look out but we need to make sure that these young people uh, are identified now uh, and get the, every bit of additional support so is there anything on, on those young people you know, to, to Daniel, in terms of, of um uh, Robbie, sorry in terms of um the health services um we have uh, sought and received additional funding for uh, children who are fostered and children who are looked after in order to address the very issues that, that you've raised. Uh, so that, that has been done. Now, obviously, in, uh, we endeavour to do the absolute best we can in all, all circumstances. Uh, and as I say, we've identified, as I say, a number of the issues similar to the ones that you've raised and, and have responded. From um, an education uh, authority side, we have um, we know there's around 600 children looked after who are accessing school placements mm -hmm. at, at the minute. Um, and we have assigned um, a children looked after um, specialist from the children looked after pro project team to the schools with the highest population of children looked after to be able to work with those staff, families and young people through um, these restrictions um, to make sure that that they um, are supported in, in their um, emotional well-being as well as their, their engagement with their, their teaching and learning. 
We also have a directory of weak resources and Turk tools to support home learning and emotional regulation and connection for our children of doctor um, population. Um, we also have a helpline that's available to all schools should they need to be get in contact for any additional guidance or, or support. Um, and we are working um, to make sure that, that children of doctors um, personal education plans and um, that they are continued with schools and, and that schools are supported to, to complete those um, the, the PEPs to make sure that any um, any of the young people you know that their individual needs are, are identified and met um, and we all and alongside the children of doctor team again from our EOTIS our, our education welfare service sorry would be working with all of our schools around the vulnerable young people attending school and any of the 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 themes or, or problems that are coming through that, that they can support with on a, on a welfare capacity um, and through our EOTIS programs we have a number of our young people who are undertaking or, or would have been undertaking exams but are under undertaking those accreditations through this year and they are supported on site and um, through their curriculum delivery um, and, and ensuring I think the the multidisciplinary teams around these young people are well connected at that operational and local level. Okay, Robbie. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Nick, Nicola, Nicola, sorry, I need to stop you. Your, your audio is. Um, incomprehensible there apologies um is it worth uh logging out and back in again maybe just to see if we can change that if you want to have one more go there i'll check but I, it, it was it was so um that we couldn't we couldn't understand what you were saying try again can you hear me now anyway? I, I, because i knew you were going to say can i hear me now <laughs> I knew you were saying can i hear can you hear me now but, but we won't we won't hear anything else do you want to try logging out and logging back in? And I'll come back to you in the next round. Okay, Nicola? Thank you. Bring in uh, Justin McNulty, MLA. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ricky, Brenda, Shauna, and Eilish. Um, in terms of what you've probably heard um, Siobhan O'Neill discuss earlier, which I've been raising for quite some time now, the recharge program. What additional resource is being brought forward by the department to ensure that uh, resource program is actioned in the mainstream education and even more so in special schools. What additional resources are being appropriated to enable that to make a difference for children and young people? Justin, are you talking about the Engage program in relation to the lost learning? Well, the, engaged program, the, the, engaged program, the engaged program has been enacted already and i'd say it's um from the feedback i've received it's it falls way way short of the mark in terms of actually making an impact making an impact to young people's lives so what i've been calling for all along and what siobhan o'neill has supported and that's that recharge program which goes above and beyond that helps children catch up to recharge emotionally physically mentally academically and socially and you know, children and, and young people in mainstream schools are going to be impacted incredibly adversely, more so those in special schools and those coming back into special schools. I know the special schools are open and, and many children are there, but some aren't. What additional resource has been given from the department to enable that to happen effectively? I, th I think, Justin, this, this is something that the department um, needs to look at on a holistic basis. I know this was raised with the minister when he was in the chamber, I think it uh, may have been yesterday or, or the day um, before. Um, Brenda has mentioned the Engage programme. There will be an Engage programme um, for special schools. I think uh, we're now looking at planning for what can be brought forward in the next financial year, which is from the 1st of April onwards, uh, and what needs to carry on at that point. So. Um, Plans, uh, discussions are happening, plans uh, are being made and options are being considered. So, of course, all of that will be subject to securing the additional funding that's required to to deliver that. And, you know, we, we don't have any certainty on our budget yet. I think you may have already received a briefing on the budget situation. So, of course, all of it will be predicated on that. But I can assure you that um, those conversations are happening and those plans are being made. Okay, thanks, Reggie. How many kids are in special schools today? 
Attendance is around 50 percent. It's just under 50 percent. Um, it fluctuates. Uh, so you're talking in and around 3,000. Okay. Um, and you have to, we have to all recognize the incredible work that's going on in special schools and the, the, the sense of fear that's been existing amongst staff around the PPE issue amongst um, because they feel differently because they, their, their schools have been kept open, even though they're co completely committed to their, their pupils, they feel at risk. What additional resource has been provided to ensure those special school staff are feeling safe and are, are safe and feeling safe? And um, what are you doing to ameliorate the, the sense of uh, annoyance and frustration that those staff are feeling with the announcement that some staff in special schools will have had will be getting prioritised for vaccination, and is that, I think is Justin, that just for? Um, so, just in terms of support for special schools, um, there certainly has been um, an enhancement in the level of wraparound support for special schools. The EA has put in a. Um, Cross directorate approach in terms of of supporting them for staff shortages, in terms of PPE, in terms of risk assessments, in terms of transport arrangements. Um, there has been updated guidance. It's updated on a regular basis. The department has also been part of that. The PHA have been involved in terms of providing assurance around transmission rates and any additional mitigations um, that can be put in place. So. Um, also, in terms of money, any money that's been required for anything, the schools uh, have been told to engage with their dedicated um, cross-organisational liaison officers, their colos, and their, they have dedicated special schools officers, and they have finance officers. There's a, a whole network of support that has been put in place for um, special schools, and that will continue for, uh, for the foreseeable. Just in terms of the vaccination. Um, the announcement was only made um, a couple of days ago. We are still at the planning stage. I'm at risk of repeating some of what I've said earlier. Um, but look, we are working with the special schools and the EA and the PHA in terms of the rollout of this. And of course, our minister was very clear um, that uh, he made the case strongly for all school staff and within that cohort for special school staff to have priority. So we're moving forward with the Department of Health on the planning arrangements on, on that basis. You know, just to stress again, they have responsibility for setting the criteria. They have to adhere to the JCVI, JCVI um, principles. We have to work uh, within that. So we will do our best um, within that framework to deliver what we can. Right, well, I would challenge on who, who says what to follow, what to follow within the JCVA uh, regulations or recommendations. I don't believe that is necessarily the case. Why should we? Um, they can make recommendations. We well, don't necessarily have to follow uh, them. Um, I, feel, I feel concerned that you know, for 14 months, there's going to be no real dispensation for, for uh, staff in special schools. And the feedback I'm getting from those staff is they do not feel safe and they feel that they've been abandoned. They feel that they've been forgotten about. I'm not going to label that point correctly. That's how the staff feel in those environments. I want to, to talk to... Eilish, briefly in relation to looked after children, to children at risk. And Eilish, you know something I've been very concerned about from the very uh, outset of this pandemic. How are those kids? So, um, un unfortunately, um, the number of looked after children has increased over the course of the pandemic. So we've now got 178 more children in care than we had um, in April um, of this year. But I mean, I just want to assure you that um, of the supports necessary um, to support those children um, are um, and have been put um, in place. So they continue to be supported by their um, social workers, um, for um, example. And we have, um, as has been done in education, you know, we have put additional resources, I mean, financial resources into um, the looked after children um, system. So in, into foster carers, for example. Um, we provided them with, with additional um, money. The majority of children um, in care are in foster care, as you know, and um, Justin, um, we provided additional funding um, to our residential care homes too, and that's for the purpose of augmenting and staffing um, within um, those homes. So I, mean, I think we've, we've done everything possible to ensure that they are looked after during this very difficult um, time, but but it has, it has been a challenge um, for them during periods 
of, of lockdown, etc. You know, maintaining contact with their families, etc., has been um, a, a, a a particular um, challenge. Um, but we have done everything possible and um, to ensure that they have the maximum level of support um, needed at, at, at this particular time. I think we have to applaud our foster carers, our foster families. One of my neighbours, mm -hmm. Big Pat McCullough, his family on Namakane Road, do that. And it's an incredibly important role. I know Robbie does that as well. And um, so we, we we give them major credits. And in terms of those those increased numbers, uh, has the system been able to accommodate them? How how has how have you been able to accommodate those? And are they all well and safe? Okay, so in terms of where they're accommodated, so children in care will be um, either in foster care, and that includes kinship care, that can be in re residential care. Um, some of them, unfortunately, spend periods of time um, in secure care. Some children actually remain at home um, with their parents um, while they are in care. The majority of those who have come into the system um, over the course of um, the pandemic um, are... Um, with kinship carers, so they're they're with family and friends who have put their hands up um, to look after children of um, family um, members and, and and will be supported um, like other foster carers and um, non kinship care and um, foster carers um, you know to the um, provision of um, foster care allowances and etc. So that's where the majority of them are. Some of them are in residential care um, too. And um, Justin. But it has been a challenge. The system is under pressure, um, given the increase in, in, in the numbers. If you, if you take it that an average children's um, home might have around um, five um, children in, in it, um, you know, that's the equivalent of about 30 additional children's homes. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, that's not where I'm saying they are. Um, but, but that's the magnitude of, of the number that have entered the system. So, uh, okay, just, uh, Justin, sorry, just need, need a final, final question, Justin, thanks. I'm still just really concerned about yep. what you're telling us here, Aish. You're, you're saying there's been family breakdown as a consequence of this pandemic, and that's very, very worrying for society. It's very worrying for mostly for those children, mostly for those children. And I'm hoping, uh, I want reassurance from you that those children have been having people's, having the system's arms wrapped around them with care and love and, and attention to make sure they feel safe and make sure they keep, feel cared for and make sure that they know that society is looking out from it. Is that the key essential? I mean, that's the, that's the responsibility of the social care system, you know, so that's why we have social workers allocated to each of these um, young people and um, Justin. Um, so, I mean, a, 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 as far as I can, I want to assure you um, that those children are being provided with the best level of care that we can possibly um, give them, um, regardless of where they are in the, in the care um, system. Thank you very much, Aisha. Very important work. Thank you. Thanks for those questions, Justin. Thank you. Can I bring Nicola Brogan back in? Thanks, Chair. Hopefully you can hear me better now. Can indeed. Thanks, Nicola. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your uh, presentations today. I would just like to make the point that um, I think nursery schools should be included within the Engage programme as well. We all know it's a crucial stage um, in a child's development, so we should be supporting nurseries as best we can um, and to the same kind of level as other schools. So we'd back that. Um, I know this has been discussed extensively um, this morning, this afternoon. But in light of the decision to make the vaccine available to staff um, providing close personal care to children in special schools, a move which I fully welcome, um, in fact, I think should be given to all staff within special schools. Um, but Eilish, maybe this is for you. Do you think further consideration will be given to those providing childcare to very young preschool children who also work closely with um, those in their care? You're on mute. Yep, Alice, sorry, you're on mute there. Apologies. Um, for no that. problem. Thank you. Re representations have been made um, on behalf of the childcare um, sector to have them included in, in the vaccination um, programme, and, and we, we brought that to the attention of um, Patricia Donnelly um, within the department who is leading on the vaccination um, programme. Unfortunately, we're not at that stage at, at, at the minute. Um, I think there is potential for individuals in certain um, occupations to be included in the programme at a later point, but we are not there um, yet. And um, Nicola, there may be some um, disabled children um, in childcare, and, and Ricky and I have had um, discussions about how um, those childcare settings are potentially brought into um, this phase of, of, of the programme um, alongside special um, schools. Thanks for that, Elish. Um, 
I, I suppose I accept that you raised it with um, Patricia Donnelly's rolling out the vaccine program, but I just I do think it's so important that the childcare sector isn't overlooked, you know, in all of us here. But thank you for that. Um, another point I wanted to raise was the rollout of digital equipment. Um, the equipment and support is being limited to children in receipt of free school meals. Does that criteria capture the need amongst children with special educational needs and should the criteria be widened? Do you think? Uh, that's probably one for for the department here, Nicola. Um, I mean, I, I have an update on the latest position in relation to the the provision of of devices. Um, you know, including you know the further allocation of seventeen thousand seven hundred additional devices to go out um this month, uh, and up to the fifteenth of February there were around um eleven thousand. In terms of the uh, criteria, I don't have um, the detail. I know support was targeted at disadvantaged and vulnerable learners, that is those who are entitled to free school meals and have special educational needs or are newcomer or looked after children or are considered vulnerable. And priority was given to pupils who are now in years 4, 7, 12 uh, and 14. Um, and all requests for devices from the priority year groups have been met. And then the priority group was extended to include disadvantaged and vulnerable pupils currently in years 11 and 13. Um, we'd be very happy to respond in writing to the committee with uh, your particular uh, question, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that'd be great, Ricky. Thank you. That's me, Chair. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Thanks. Morris there? Nope. Okay, I don't think Morris is there. If we get him back in in the next 30 seconds, <laughs> I'll try and bring him back in. Um, otherwise, folks, can I uh, say a very sincere thank you for your time today? Um, had a raft of questions there, and it's, it's obviously uh, a vitally important issue that we make sure the support is in place for the most vulnerable children in our community. So we, we wish you well in your ongoing work in that regard and um, look forward to being kept up to date uh, in relation to progress being made. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all witnesses and add members back into the spotlight and remind you that you are now uh, audible? And can I ask the clerk to summarise uh, any actions uh, resulting from that briefing for us. Thanks, Clark. Okay, so um, we had some uh, coverage of uh, benchmarking at the beginning, which I thought was interesting and would be worth following up um, on. That was Robin's line of questioning um, in terms of uh, you know learning and benchmarking for uh, future pandemic planning and just to see where we are in a comparative sense. And um, then on special school vaccination, um, there was a lot of welcome to the decision that's been made, but um, members wanted an assurance that uh, you know there would be clarity in the implementation um, and rollout of that. Um, Robbie made a particular question about um, categories of children um, uh, subject to the FLARE program and also children at risk of paramilitary grooming. Um, Youth services um, are to come back to the committee with a full update, so um, we'll seek that in the correspondence. Um, then on Nicola's last point, um, there was also an undertaking that um, the department would come back in writing. I think that was the end of the digital equipment um, question, was it, Nicola? Yeah, yeah. just um, about widening the criteria, maybe. Say again? Just about widening the criteria. Okay, perfect. So I will um, listen back to just pick up anything additional um, because there was a lot of to and fro on the teams about coverage and um, people get falling out and getting back in again. Members, do you have anything else that you want to be reflected um, on the, at the end of that evidence session? Sorry, Clerk, my line's bad, so I'm getting with some patients. Just, uh, did you mention nurse, engage for nursery places there? Um, I didn't. No, that's right. that. Yeah, that's all. Right. 
I think yeah. that has to be uh, added definitely. The, the department can't preach about the importance of uh, early intervention and then entirely neglect that, uh, particularly at the most crucial time. So I think that needs to be quite strongly made by this committee. Okay. I mentioned, and I mean the the other like the initial conversation at the beginning. Our members can tend to take that up with the minister um, next week. Yeah, I, th I think we could write to the minister in relation to that um, uh, as well to get a response. But absolutely, uh, can raise it next week as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other members want to come in on those actions? Nope. Sure, oh, just can we, can, we yes, maybe Justin. Probe, can we maybe probe that issue I was raising with Elliot there, just in terms of the family breakdown? And I know it's not necessarily an issue for education per se, and this, I'm putting this out there. Can we get to some, some clear figures in terms of how many kids are in school whose families have now been have broken down as a consequence of the added pressures that have been brought around by this pandemic? Yeah, get some data from Elish around. Uh, looked after children in school, yeah, during the pandemic, Justin, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah, you. Okay. Any other actions, members? No. Nope. Okay. Content to agree those actions. Agreed? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that takes us on to agenda item seven, members, correspondence. Can I refer members to page 51, where we have seven items of correspondence? and a summary note at pages 52 to 53. Uh, Clark, do you wish to speak to the correspondence? Yes, I will indeed. Um, just to highlight a few items, members, um, item 7.2 on page 54 is a response from the department on issues raised by the Belfast Youth Forum. Um, the department indicates that they also met with the Belfast Youth Forum um, to discuss its report on relationship and sexuality education. Uh, the committee had an informal meeting with the Youth Forum um, three weeks ago. Um, so just members, are you content to note this response and forward it to the Belfast Youth Forum? Yeah, m members, if I can just come in on that one. Uh, content to note and, and forward it to the Belfast Youth Forum to, to request their response. I, I don't think they're going to be um, content with the response themselves. Um, it's fairly limited. Um, I think the issue of RSC is maybe something that the committee should consider a, an education committee motion on. I'm happy to draft text on that and bring that back to a future meeting for consideration. But in the meantime, members content for that correspondence to be forwarded to the Belfast Youth Forum. Agreed? Content. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Then on uh, item 7.3 on page 59 is a response from the department about information on the numbers of church representatives and parent governors on boards of governors um, in the sectors of control and Catholic maintained schools. Um, and we can forward that information to um, the member of the public who raised the matter with the committee um, and members will also wish to note it then um, just for information there are a couple of sessions coming up in the forward work program on FETO and uh, with UNESCO um, and that might be uh, useful data. Are you content with that? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Yep, members content. Okay, so um, item 7.6 on page 72 um, is correspondence from an individual regarding concerns that exams and vigilators continue to lose money due to exam cancellation. The committee wrote to DE um, about this last year. Um, however, CCEA took the decision that no payments would be made um, last year following the cancellation of the summer 2020 exam series. Um, so members, uh, I'm not sure that you, you would want to escalate this um, at this time. I think Robbie and Daniel had raised this previously. Daniel, do you want to comment on the exam and vigilator issue at this stage? Yeah, sure. We, we, we brought this up uh, quite a bit. Um, and there's been no real clarification around it. The department haven't... Um, been keen to provide any form of funding for invigilators whatsoever. Uh, I think a lot of them, uh, and it's about it's going to happen again. So a lot of them have been left in limbo. 
uh, with uncertainty. Now, when I raised it with the with SIA originally and with the minister, I was continually told, we're looking at this, we're looking at this, we're looking at this, and then all of a sudden nothing. So these people have been left without that income. Uh, and that's a big issue. Uh, and it's happening again. So, yeah, across a, a series of, of series now. Uh, do the committee want to resubmit correspondence of that nature to ask the department and SIA whether they have any plans of uh, responding to uh, lost um, lost work of examined legislators. Members content just to submit that inquiry, yeah? Content. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Um, item 7, 7 on page 73 and also in the table papers um, is correspondence from indi individuals concerned about the Minister's decision to remove uh, the WJEC qualifications from the approved list available to NI learners. Um, the committee has written to the Minister on this issue because it was raised last week um, and in fact we factored in a couple of the details um, from these letters um, in, that, in that letter. Um, so if members are content to note it, uh, we can just inform the concerned individuals um, that we have already uh, sought to deal with this. Yeah, we obviously raised that earlier, but yeah, if we can if we can reply to the individuals to advise them that we have written to the department on the matter and that we'll provide them with their response as soon as possible. Members content? Good yep. Time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then everything else is just as per the summary of page 52. Okay, thank you, Clark. Okay. Members content to uh, dispose of the correspondence as per summary note of page 52. Agreed? Yep, yep. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members then, agenda item 8, forward work programme. Can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at page 93 of your packs? And uh, I seek your endorsement for the forward work programme as amended. Um, the Minister has agreed uh, to attend next week's meeting to discuss a range of developments in education and we look forward to receiving him. Health officials um, were not available next week, so we'll ask them to attend at, at another opportunity. Um, Chair. Or, yes, Daniel. Chair, sorry uh, for interrupting continually. Uh, I'm glad the Minister is coming to the committee next week, but. I would like it if this, uh, if we could get the minister straight in and straight to questions. We know what the problems are. They've been raised with us every single day. For the minister to give a 15-minute preamble and then us asking questions after him fluffing up a very serious situation, I, I think it's a waste of time. I think we should just cut straight to questions. It's better use of the minister's time and it's better use of our time uh, in terms of uh, our role uh, in holding him and the department to account over these issues. Yeah, I, I think there have been uh, situations where he is providing new information to the committee and it's appropriate for him to make an opening statement. And indeed, I, I would hold that perhaps we give him a significantly truncated period of time to make an opening statement, um, should, he, should he wish. But yeah, I agree with you. We need, to, we need to get down to brass tacks on a wide range of issues next week. So um, if members are content to... Um, afford the minister a short opening statement of no more than um, five minutes, perhaps. Pat? Uh, could I just ask, Chris, how long do we have the minister for? Uh, I mean, usually in these situations, and I'm on the TEO committee uh, with Colin, and, you know, the first and deputy first or the junior ministers come in, they usually give as much time as is needed to, to, to drill into whatever issues are current at the time. So... Uh, uh, we're not on a, a tight time scale with the minister next week, are we? I, I think, in my experience, he's, he's given about an, an hour, an hour and a half, uh, most of the time. Um, Clark, do you know if he specified uh, a time period for next week? No, just that he would like to come at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. Well, if we can, if we can find out uh, timings in advance of that, Pat, I understand what you're saying, and you know, I take Daniel's point as well. We need to maximize the time that we have with the minister given the range of issues that we need to discuss yeah. okay so okay nine o'clock start next week um so you've got you know nine nine through to 12 30 or one um 
and to only two sessions. So there is yeah, no, a commitment. It's, uh, it's the education minister and, and SIA, so there obviously there will be a focus on exams with SIA and, and the minister to a certain extent as well, but there will be a range of other issues, obviously. So we'll, we'll try and make sure we time that appropriately. Okay. Um, okay. We have to be out by twelve actually next week, so it's nine until twelve. Not if I presume not if we're fully virtual. Um, I understand that. Um, that even though we're fully virtual, uh, I'll check how much flexibility we have there. Yeah, if if, if we can check because uh, yeah. yeah, we might have to review that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Clark, do you do you want to speak to some information on the forward work program with regards to the education authority? Um, Education Authority was due to attend committee um, on area planning for specials and mainstream schools on the 10th and the 24th of March and the consultations have been extended on the 12th of April um, so the 10th and the 24th of March are now free slots, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Um, so okay. you, if you look at the, word, at the forward work programme just now at uh, page 93, you'll see that that leaves, um, we've got a gap on 24th of February um, also then on the 10th of March and the 24th of March. So um, just in respect of items that um, members might want to bring up the programme, there is some flexibility there. Um, and I know uh, restraint and seclusion was one um, issue that we had previously scheduled and could usefully come back in um, on any of those dates. Also the 24th of um February, there's a UN um, Convention on the Rights of the Child um, kind of reporting week that week, so the committee may want to have a thematic um, link up there. Okay. Yeah, it was our intention to take uh, further evidence on restraint and seclusion from parent action and potentially, if at an appropriate stage, the, uh, the department. Um, as well as I think to receive a briefing on, from RIA's on research, Clark, is that right? Yes? Yes. Okay. Would, would members be content to take the Department Parent Action and RIA's on the issue of restraint and seclusion on the 24th of February? Content. Content, yes. okay. Okay. And then we also then have March, we don't need to agree this today per se, but we would then have Wednesday the 10th of March and Wednesday the 24th of March free. Um, I was of a mind, and I, th I think I mentioned it previously, that maybe we'd like to take a session on uh, children and young people's voices, where you could, for example, on the Wednesday 10th of March, perhaps invite the Northern Ireland Youth Forum um, the secondary students union northern ireland and, and maybe any other children and young people's umbrella organizations we deem to be appropriate is that is that something for us to consider members yeah, absolutely agreed okay so yes. clark maybe we could think about a, a children's and young people's voice theme session for wednesday the 10th of march and we'll we'll return um on wednesday the 24th of march the only thing uh we might need to bear in mind is hopefully we will have a, a, a return to school um, in some of those dates as well where we, where we may need to bring the minister back but um, Clark are you happy to um, provisionally bring those sessions from today yeah yes I'll, I'll check people's availability I suppose we can't you know sure. um, edit it in stone today in any case um, so okay. just to come back to the timings for next week, um, it's we begin at nine o'clock and um, we can go on a bit longer um, because we don't now have to leave time for the room to be the cleaned. Okay. So there is a bit more leeway with the virtual meeting. Okay, so, that's that's helpful. Okay, okay, members content to agree the forward work program at this stage? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, any other business? No. No. Okay. Then our meeting next week then is scheduled for uh, 9 a.m. And if we conduct it via uh, Starleaf, that gives us uh, more time with the minister and SIA as well. So I uh, appreciate everyone's um, patience and cooperation with Starleaf. Maybe we'll um, review that offline further to today just to check that, that, that we are overcoming some of the challenges. Um, and if not, then we can consider whether we need 
and it is essential for anyone to be pr uh, physically present in a, a meeting room or, or indeed um, via a wired PC at the assembly. But um, next next meeting, uh, next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Um, and members uh, content to keep me posted on the, the suitability of Starleaf, then the meeting does not adjourn. Thank, Thank you. you, members. Thanks. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.